life Some rain must fall But too much is falling In my Into each heart Some tears must fall But someday the sun will shine Some folks can lose the blues in their hearts But when I think of you And now the shower starts Into each life Some rain must fall But too much is falling in my Into each and every life Some rain is gotta fall But uh, too much of that stuff is falling into mine And into each heart Some tears is gotta fall But I know that someday That sun is bound
Greetings. Well met. Light be with you. King's Honor friend. What can I do for you? Hey guys, what's up? Mad Season here. Back with another stream for you. And we have a treat for you today. Something a little bit different for you guys today. Um, we're going to be doing a react. Oh, well, actually, hang on. First off, I want to say thank you to Knocked Off for the Prime. I want to say thank you to Metal Piper as well. And also, uh, Adrian Cortez, what's up? Thank you for the $2 donation. He says he loves the videos, always fantastic editing. editing. Well, you're in for a treat today, Adrian, because we're going to be actually watching one of my videos. <laughs> How's it going today, everybody? Um, I wanted to do something a little bit special for you today. So, I talked about this a, a long time ago. The idea, a big request from the Monotone Madness for quite a while has been... Um, let me turn this down a little bit. The idea of reactions. And this is going to make a lot of you guys angry, because I know a lot of you guys dislike reactions. It's viewed as kind of lazy content. Um, <clears throat> before you threaten to murder me and my entire family, though, I'll just have you know, this will be my own video, okay? So I have asked myself permission. Hey, Mad Season Show. You're such an amazing editor. You're so great and handsome. And you are extremely attractive and intelligent and also humble could i react to one of your videos oh hey bro yeah thank you man i really appreciate you watching absolutely just make sure you link the video in the description i feel like that's pretty uh pretty standard etiquette within reactions appreciate you watching the content i want let me know what your thoughts on the video are and i look forward to uh seeing that all right thank you bro yeah i totally will do that all right see permission given out i have my own permission um, and today, this has been um, a long time in the running here, I was going to react to episode one of my series, Pandora's Box, World of Warcraft, um, which is like two hours long, and I'm sure I'm going to be pausing like crazy, and we're going to talk about it. I'm going to extrapolate on some more points and thoughts I had in the video that maybe I, I cut because... You know, the video's already two hours long, it's a little bit too long. And I also want to take a more of an educational-based approach to it, kind of going into more of the nerdy stuff with um, the video editing, how I did these certain shots and stuff, and what I was thinking um, with the video and my thoughts now, looking back to it. And it should be fun. It should be fun. I, uh, I look forward to kind of sharing my thoughts on my own video and um you know who knows if you <clears throat> if you uh, guys enjoy this we can maybe do it with more episodes more of my videos more of other people's videos yeah it's kind of like a director's commentary if you will if that doesn't sound too pretentious that's probably very pretentious sounding but yeah yeah that's what that's what we're gonna do today i wanted to start off in world of warcraft here because to do my normal intro but i have the video all loaded up here i have to do a little bit of um tertiary setup here on the fly you'll excuse me for this capybaras thank you for the tier one for six months uh ailed ailed h as well thank you for the prime thank you for watching my streams you guys uh quick quick update on the video before oh i'm sorry i just burped in your ear before we move on um i do have a um uh, sod review in the works and it's it's pretty much finished i want to give it a couple more once overs before i release it for you guys though typically when i finish these videos i kind of like to let them settle for a couple of days to see how i feel at it or feel about it approach it with a fresh set of eyeballs and usually by doing that i can catch errors or i can just catch badly edited parts and make the video even better but yeah, we got a sod review that's pretty much done i will uh and I'll get that on the channel for you guys in a few days, hopefully. Okay, so let me switch on over here. To Chrome. Well, actually, I need to copy uh, my alerts. I need to make sure alerts are going on here, too. You'll, uh, you'll excuse me as I um, do this initial setup stuff. By the way, how's, how's it going, you guys? I want to say hi to Geo, Drifter, J-Dog, Ailed as well. Oh, Ailed just says, I just wanted to say... Video shaped a lot of my classic experience. We talk about you all the time, your group of real life friends. Glad you're doing these. Ailed, 
Thank you for watching my videos, and uh, thank you for the support there. I'm glad that you enjoy them. I like making them, so I also like that you enjoy them. Thank you. I'll say what's up to Professor Dr. Patrick, um, Priestess as well, Tom Zoo, Brachio, Tainted Ecstasy, Alex, Felix, Dalton, everybody. Everybody. I want to say thank you to Mefskane as well. The 500 bits, he says, it's been a long time. What, long time fan watching my watching on YouTube. Uh, you're doing the rank 14 grind at the same time as you were. Oh, God, you know the pain, huh? It was pretty dope to randomly clash with you and your squad from time to time. Hi, Warlord, Kaner, Orc Hunter. Hey, it was uh, nice to clash with you, too. I have a lot of memories of the rank 14 grind. Many of them are unpleasant. <laughs> I'll say that much, but you know what? A lot of them were pleasant as well and cool. But uh, yeah, the rank 14 grind, I always say, is something I'm glad I did because I made a lot of friends for it, but something I'll never do again. It's a little bit too hardcore for me, for this casual gamer dad. Um, TRL Mosby as well. Thank you for the prime. Okay, so I want to copy my alerts widget here, and I want to switch to Chrome. I'm going to paste my alerts widget. And I need to recapture Chrome here. Um, with... Where is it? I swear I have Chrome up. It's not showing Chrome. The... Oh, here we go. Wait, what? What to do? Black screen. Why no work? Let me delete this source. Sorry, it's my first time streaming, you guys. You'll ha you have to understand. You have to understand. This is all new to me. Capture. Window capture. Add source. Chrome. I always have trouble capturing Chrome for some reason. I have no idea why. What the hell? It's not capturing. <laughs> Windows 10. Um, it's classic. It's my Twitch. I don't want to capture that app. Oh god. What is going on? Maybe I relaunch Chrome. How about that? Let's relaunch Chrome. Bear with me, you guys. I'm sorry. I suck at this. Dude, why is it not showing Chrome? Oh my god. Maybe I should relaunch my stream. Maybe I need to relaunch my... Oh, here we go. Okay, just popped up randomly. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, I should resize this, and I also wanted to get the chat on here too, so hang on, you're going to get another black screen as we set this up. Um, if this goes well and you guys like it, Kowser, thank you for the Prime, Viralis as well, thank you for the uh, Prime as well, thank you guys, appreciate you. Um, if you guys enjoy this i was thinking of maybe so i have an alternate channel it's called bad season show it's been very inactive um i was thinking of maybe repurposing it into a reaction based channel called mad season show reacts or something i don't know uh it depends if you guys like this or not though okay i want to also you're gonna see another black screen here i want to get my uh my twitch chat on here too so we copy copy the chat um, and I'm gonna, well, taking this into account, I might go ahead and post-production. No, 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 don't start. I might in post-production change uh, where the chat is. Well, I'll just try to find a good spot for it. That's what I'll do. Thank you for bearing with me, by the way. Chat box. Go here. I'll just put it in the lower right. And we'll just do this. Okay. 
All right, something special, something new for you guys here today. Um, as I said, we're going to be doing a reaction. We might go ahead and uh, do a little World of Warcraft after this, but I, um, I've been wanting to do some reactions here for quite a while, and I've, I wanted to uh, start off with my own videos. This will be... So this is a two-hour video, so I suggest you grab a drink, you grab some snacks, you grab whatever the F it is you want to grab, um, and be prepared for the monotone commentary over monotone, monotone commentary. Um, this will be, the purpose of this will be entertainment, educational. I want to extrapolate further on some of the points that I brought up in this video, commentate on it, um, maybe commentate on some errors if I can find any, provide maybe a mini update because this uh, video was released two years ago at this point. Oops. Um, and also more on the enter uh, more of the education side effect of things more of kind of like the nerdy stuff of how i did certain shots we'll go into some of my editing tricks how i did like this shot how i did that shot um yeah and just have a good time so we're gonna react to my own content yes indeed I'm, this is very pretentious i know but consider it as sort of like a director's commentary you know when you get uh, like the the special editions of uh of DVDs and whatnot, they kind of come with commentaries and special features. This is a special feature of World of Warcraft Pandora's Box, one of my longest videos, one of my most popular videos. Is the sucker's at uh, 2.7 million views at this point, which is crazy. So, without any further delay, we're gonna be pausing like crazy. Let's go ahead and see what is held within within the box, Pandora's Box, Episode One. I'm going to go ahead and pause here. <laughs> so this series is very, very near and dear to my heart. Um, you'll notice the whole VHS aesthetic with it. Um, I love analog horror movies. I like analog footage in general. And uh, the whole uh, uh, motif slash theme, if you will, of Pandora is going to be VHS related. And we're going to talk about how I got some of these shots. Um, this is really... This is, um, I guess you could say this video is my swan song of YouTube. This is probably the video that took the most amount of time for me. I worked on this video for months, 12 hours a day. Yeah, a lot of time and effort went into that, into this video. So, yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've seen this throughout like the course of editing hundreds of times, but it has been a couple of years, so I'm sure I'll forget a lot of stuff. So let's just continue on here. And I, I can't wait to hear what my voice sounds like. A.K. Owens, thank you, man, for the prime. So this is actually in my house here. This is in my uh, my my house. I have a bunch of old analog TVs. Some of these are some of these are from my childhood. Some of these I bought from eBay. I kind of had a vision of this of the uh, the feel of this series for quite a while. Um, and here I'll continue to play here. We'll we'll do the intro and then we'll I'll pause and commentate on some of the more nerdy editing stuff here. An obsession. Sure, but the question is, does the international addiction to an internet game represent a danger? Ooh. Maybe, but there is also no absolutely true. That Indian can slow the explosive growth, growth of the, the intoxicating game, game called World, World of Warcraft. Warcraft. Oh damn. <laughs> Shout out to Vibes. Uh audio levels check. How's okay, quick, I'm sorry to pause again. Is my voice too loud or too quiet in comparison to uh the video that we're watching? Should I should I turn this the volume of the video down or up? Please let me know in chat. And by the way, you don't want to, that to do that. You think you do, you think you do but, but you, you don't. don't. It's good. Audio's fine. Audio's great. All right, cool. Thank you. You guys take care of us, man. Yes, you guys really take care of us. All I gang views all day, every day. What a Chad. That's an undead rogue right there, if I ever saw it. Incredible 16 hours a day. His mother says his personality has changed and that he's become moody and violent, and his addiction is tearing the family apart. MMO addiction, it's a very real thing. We will be talking about that soon. 
Um, this song was actually custom made by White Bat Audio. The link to the, the, the soundtrack can be found in the description. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have been able to tell that it's from Clockwork Orange, uh, Queen Elizabeth's Funeral March, done in more of a kind of a synthetic uh, retro 70s style. I felt like it felt it, it fit really well. It was commissioned. I had the song customly commissioned. All the legendary moments. Power level where I basically get all the good loot and they get all the great experience. Showing off all the, the big community moments. I basically wanted to set a feel, a theme. I wanted you to dive right into it. I wanted to go over all of the dives, the Leroy, the Hobbs. I wanted to, I wanted to make you feel like you were back in 04 to 07 through the intro of this, of this movie here. Um, all of the footage that you're seeing in front of you. So I have this adapter. I have a laptop next to all of those monitors with an adapt. So I put the videos on the laptop and then I use an adapter to project the footage on the laptop to the TV screens. And I have a VCR connected to the TV screens that records the, the footage from the laptop. And then I just play it back. Um, the camera I'm using is my phone camera. It has, it's very kind of poor quality, but I actually kind of wanted to... Uh, that's the theme I kind of wanted for this video. I wanted it to be poor quality. I wanted it to look very campy very amateurish and uh that's sort of an intentional thing and also to save money on a really expensive camera um and basically what i would do is i would record it over a vhs and if i wanted maybe some distortion or something i would manually like crinkle the vhs tape and stuff so you'd see you'd see the video jump around you'll see uh it being distorted and stuff um, there is a lot of time and effort going into the aesthetics of this series. Like there, it was really, really fun, but like, yeah, for a lot of this video series, I'm like on, on the floor of my room, like messing around with VHS tapes and, and, uh, it was, it was a very, very, um, fun and creative thing for me to do. Um, it was nice to go outside of the, the general, you know, the, the run of the mill editing, record footage on your on your computer, then put throw it in Vegas and whatnot. It's very different and very fun. I loved I found that I love doing this stuff and that's that's a theme that I follow throughout all the Pandora's box series. I do a lot of this kind of like real life filming. And um I learned this uh basically self taught on YouTube. Just YouTube tutorials. I don't I don't have any formal training in video editing. Enter world, the world of Warcraft, legendary game. So the purpose of this video is to uh, encompass from start to finish all of WoW, pre-development, release, expansion by expansion, all the way up until 2021, uh, the highs and lows, um, big events, not only with the game, but with Blizzard Entertainment. And I'm sure I'm gonna cringe at my own voice here. My voice is gonna sound very different I was uh, I recorded this on a different mic. I think also maybe I didn't hit puberty or something. So I'm probably gonna be like higher higher pitched. Let's see what happens. Oh God, what what am I gonna sound like here? I'm sound in the very... world of the MMO RPGs. Oh my God! Scarcely find anyone who hasn't heard. Of... This guy is so monotone. He needs to put life into his voice. <laughs> of if not played, the world of Warcraft. Released in 2004, it would quickly begin to make a name for itself, garnering worldwide praise for it. I feel like almost I have more life in my voice these days. Um, also, of course, because this was scripted content too. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not the best script reader out there. I sound so young and innocent. I like to think these days I'm a little bit more expressive, maybe. I don't know, maybe I sound exactly the same. I actually have this magazine, by the way. This original, this was the first interview of World of Warcraft, Computer World Game. Computer Gaming World held the first screenshots and developer interviews of WoW. 
It was released in 2001. You can find this online. It's a very interesting read. For its innovation, double, thank accessibility, you. and the closeness to the community by its developer, Blizzard Entertainment, absolutely celebrated and condemned for its addictiveness. In the span mm -hmm. of a few short months, it would not only become the most yep. popular of the MMORPG genre, but also set the standard for all of those that would follow in its footsteps. Absolutely. Many would try. So before, I'm sorry I'm pausing so much, but before World of, War, World of Warcraft redefined the MMO genre, absolutely. And th this is a subject that I could talk about for 30 minutes. I'm going to try not to pause too much. I'm sorry. I know I'm pausing like crazy. But before MMOs or before uh, World of Warcraft was released, the standard for MMOs was, um, you could say this for EverQuest as well, but it was sandbox. Sandbox style MMOs to where you're just kind of thrown into this world and the content that you engage in is is what the experience is what you make of it it was player made content primarily um and it wasn't until everquest and then especially with world of warcraft is when they started switching to linear linear based leveling campaigns um number based leveling systems like level one to level two to level three zones that you're meant to go through in a, a pretty linear order like, I mean, you can't go to, you know, Searing Gorge straight from level one, right? You, you do Elwynn, then you do Westfall, then you do Red Ridge. This wasn't the case back in the day. Um, Star Wars Galaxies, for instance, I always like to bring this up as um, the standard for sandbox MMOs. You're thrown into this giant world with a survival knife and a melon with basically zero instruction. So even to have, like, an exclamation mark and quests to sort of guide you through this world... Um, customly curated raids and dungeons and everything. This was this was new and groundbreaking, and that is one of the many reasons why you're seeing this right here. You're seeing the green right over here, the World of Warcraft, right? That's this is one of the reasons for its massive success. Right, and over the course of 15 years, few would gain even a fraction of the player base of the seemingly unstoppable giant. Today, though, a much different picture is painted. What was initially considered inspirational in the world of game development now leaves behind a controversial history mm -hmm. marred with what many describe Absolutely. as betrayal, deception, and squandered potential. Absolutely. Many asking the question, how? A snapshot of history of a world created within a world. A microcosm Look of Look at the mayhem, expression in his voice. A virtual playground <laughs> for humanity to show each other their best and their worst. This is the story of Blizzard Entertainment and their iconic MMORPG, The World of Warcraft. There it is. Um, speaking more of the reputation, absolutely. Blizzard today. The Blizzard of yesteryear is comparable to the From Software of today. Um... Uh, from software today is the they're they're sort of this game developer that can do no wrong and they can release anything they could release a paper bag with a turd in it and just name it like dark souls 4 people would pre-order the deluxe edition um blizzard at one point and some people still do this with blizzard games um but blizzard at one point was the from software of of today and uh they gained that reputation through uh consistency and uh, uh, we also mentioned it there earlier, the close-knit, the tightness with the community, right? Blizzard was very, very close with their community. BlizzCon was one of the, I don't think it was the first, but it was one of the first gaming conven conven bleh, conventions based solely around one developer and their games and their games only. You, of course, have always had like E3 and um, what's the European one? Gamescom, I think. But uh, for a developer to have a, a, a convention solely based around their games was pretty unusual at the time, I will say. And um, it created this kind of like, it's, I, I don't like to say family atmosphere. I think that's a little bit too intense. But you know, the community of, of World of Warcraft and Blizzard was one of the big reasons for its success. And, you know, as they, uh, as later on, as time went on and, um, they started to transition from this identity of uh, games made for gamers by gamers to AAA, publicly traded AAA video game, game developer 
Um, a lot of that came with the Activision merger, as we'll see. Um, they started to, that reputation started to sour, and you'll, you'll see through various controversies exactly why. 1999, you guys remember when um, everybody turned off their electronics in preparation for Y2K because they thought Skynet was going to, like, murder everybody? At the dawn of the new millennium, the online world was growing rapidly. The intellect mm -hmm. of man and the advancements of technology combined bestowed upon the world the creation of the internet by, by Al Gore. Gore. <laughs> news of the new Star Wars movie was spreading, the storyboard for The Lord of the Rings. Is it douchey to laugh at my own jokes? Completed. I'm going to probably do it anyway. culture was about to reach critical mass. And Bill Clinton did not have sexual relations with that woman. And so entered the, Welcome to the 90s. multiplayer online role-playing game, or MMORPG mm -hmm. for short. The creation of the first MMO can be Muds. traced all the way back to the 70s, depending on your definition and standards, as they would be text-based. Uh, first MUD, I believe, was in the 70s. They were created, a um, lot of history with this. Uh, they were created uh, on campus, I, I, be I believe, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the first... Uh, what publicly commercial, commercially used internet was just shared between campuses and universities. And um, they're just basically students who, you know, when, when they, when they were slacking off, they were just kind of casually creating one of the most prolific game genres of all time, MUDs. Um, these were online games. They're all text-based. You could connect with other players and you, by using text commands you know, explore dungeons, kill creatures, and get loot. This is the birth of the MMORPG right here, and it wasn't, it wasn't done for money, much like most, thing, most inventions. Um, it wasn't initially done for money. It was just done solely to entertain themselves, and then, you know, later on, of course, it became a, a juggernaut. An absolute so juggernaut. That's a, that's a very, very short history right there. I just wanted to expand on that a little bit. Um, it's, it was only near the new millennia. A lot, a lot of people mark Ultima Online as like the first MMO. Other people say Neverwinter Nights. While those are certainly grandfathers, the start of the MMO were MUDs on college campuses and universities and stuff. It was very pure and innocent, and very Stone Age-like. No graphics. Uh, they would attract a sizable player base. Although varying in implementation, they all shared the central idea of an online, persistent world to be shared with players from all over the globe. Yep. A genre unique in the sense that there is no planned end, mm -hmm. no credits rolled, nor thanks for playing. Game content would be added as long as there are players playing, and the journey would only end when the player decided that it was over. A concept that was remarkably foreign to many at the time. Absolutely. In these early years, many would try their hand in breaking through the genre, and overall, good point, it Matt. Season show. Niche audience. Some were beginning to make a name for themselves, though, such as Origins. niche. Niche is right. Um, I think I show a screenshot here of like EverQuest being the most subscribed MMO. It had like ten thousand, ten thousand subscribers. That was like the most subscribed MMO pre World of Warcraft days. That's how niche the genre was. So you, you really have to understand here just how, how um, World of Warcraft brought the entire genre to a mainstream audience. You had people who never even played a video game before, period, play World of Warcraft. That's how much it took the world by storm. Systems leap into the online persistent world God, this guy's so online, an isometric fantasy game memorable for its yep. PvP combat you owe. in particular. I didn't play this, Mythic but shout out to you. Who would later develop Warhammer Online took their shot with the Dark Age of Camelot, a third person take on this is still going War, today, by the way. Norse mythology and high fantasy. Star Wars Galaxy sadly into the is world not of MMOs ripped the galaxies release the Star Wars Galaxies in MMO 03 to 2012 I think community and sandbox gameplay and most prolific at the time was EverQuest, EverQuest in 1999 by Verant Interactive and 99 Studios decrowning the previously reigning champion Ultima Online Yep, EverQuest was the biggest, and uh, you'll uh, any people, and I, I can't say for sure because I never played EverQuest. Uh, heavily, World of Warcraft heavily, heavily inspired by EverQuest. 
a lot of the developers were actually big time raiders. Jeff Kaplan was a raider in EverQuest, as was a name you'll hear later on the, in the video, Alex Afrasiabi. Pretty much all the WoW devs played EverQuest, and it was a, a big, big inspiration for World of Warcraft in, in so many ways. Rip Galaxies says Super Vader Man. Now living on across like 12 different emulators. Yeah, you can do Galaxies, but it's only in emulators. Just 24 hours after launch, it would quickly become the most subscribed MMORPG at... Uh, there it is. 10,000 subscribers. <laughs> yeah, really. 10,000 10, was the most Can you believe that? MMORPG at the time. It would eventually peak at over 500,000 years after its launch. But as history yeah, has grew, shown, it grew this bigger. would be a fraction of the potential that was hidden within the genre. A potential that had yet to be realized. Yep. There it is. This is 2001 alpha footage, I believe. Those grunts. That was the original orc grunt. The MMO was on the rise, and the time to strike was nigh. And in the background, a beast was stirring. Oh Some shit. Of the strengths, yep. the weaknesses, the successes, and the failures of the then relatively unexplored journey. World, World of Warcraft, much like many, uh, many things in life, is an amalgamation of the best of everything. They, they wanted to take, the, they said this in developer interviews, the best of EverQuest, the best of SWG, the best of Ultima Online. There's actually um, a, a, a relevant quote, I think it was by Stephen King, who just, when he was asked, like, how do you define yourself as an, as an author? And he says that all authors are, they're basically an amalgamation of their favorite authors. Maybe, maybe he likes the character development of this author. Maybe he likes the storytelling of this author. author. Maybe he likes the vocabulary of this author. Or maybe he likes the genre that this author writes. And that's basically what all authors are in a way. And I think this is going to get really deep here. I think you can also say that this is how we are shaped as people. Um, we look at the major influences uh, in our lives, typically our parents or mom, dads, siblings, friends, whatever. And that's really how I feel like in a lot of ways we form our identity. We look at our heroes in our lives and we say, yeah, I want to be like that person. I want to be as strong as I don't know, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I want to be as kind as my dad or um, as cool as my mom or something, right? Sorry, it's getting really deep and like weird, but yeah, that's what World of Warcraft was. It was the best of everything. They wanted to leave all the poopy stuff, leave the lost experience on death, leave the permanent character death, leave the stat systems that require like 10 hours of reading before you can even understand it, and just take the good stuff, take the good gameplay, take the great world design, take the great uh, lore in a lot of ways. The lore in World of Warcraft is obviously inspired from... Many sources, Tolkien being genre. Wonderful. Blizzard at this point already had established themselves as innovators with their Diablo, Starcraft, and Warcraft series, the latter being a real-time strategy game set in a fantasy world of orcs, elves, magic, and adventure. Um, world of Warcraft and was my personal games, such introduction as the table to was set. After halting wow. development two on an abandoned project, a small team of developers... There's Chris Metzen right there. Bow. There's Chris Metzen. There's Metzen. I don't uh, recognize a lot of these other people. There's um, John Stats there peeking out on the left there. John Stats, Chris Metzen. I don't recognize a lot of these other people. Off the and top of my head. Searching for inspiration on their next game. They had the IP, they had the funding, and most importantly, the timing. 2001. This is Computer Gaming World Magazine September interview. 2nd, the reveal. The reveal. Long before Blizzard was big enough to hold their own convention, they held a panel at London's European Computer Trade Show, and it was then that the public oh, Mark for Kern. the first Mark time Kern was there. saw the world of Warcraft. <laughs> This is Alpha Wow. Look at that. That is actually Wow. That's what it looked like at some point. World of Warcraft actually started as a mod from Warcraft 3, I believe. That's what it started as, a mod from Warcraft 3 before, you know, they eventually got their own engine and everything. 
but they do um you can still see a lot of remnants from warcraft 3 through like uh ability icons and whatnot and uh, some voice lines some sound effects they made it clear this was not the sequel to the popular rts series at the time but rather something completely different players would transition from controlling pre-made heroes and progressing through a campaign to creating their own heroes and making mm -hmm. their own stories. Yep. The game would be multiplayer. Sorry, I'm pausing so much, but I, I have so much I want to say about this, but that was, that was a huge draw of WoW. It was, you were, you were creating your own story. Each character you made was like your own custom, your own custom hero, completely customizable. You can name it. Um, even just that was like a, a groundbreaking was a mind-blowing thing for a lot of people back then. Player on a massive scale, bringing together fans of not only the Warcraft series, but of MMOs as a whole. The very the small fan base, however, was this point. Mixed. Some waited with eager anticipation. Yep. Some people were pissed. to imagine their beloved series making its leap into the massively multiplayer setting. And many were upset at the abrupt change of focus. True. <laughs> hang on, hang on, let's go back a little bit. Player setting. And many were up true. Worst, worst game ever, you guys. Worst game ever. This is a pre-release beta forum screen cap. Whenever you see this text, anybody who played the original game, um, whenever you played the whoever played the original game, they will remember this layout. This is the original forums for WoW. I'm not sure when they changed this, but you had the yellow text with the, the black and gray background. Called it. He called it said at the abrupt change of focus, preferring Blizzard to concentrate but on yeah, I mean, just proven to work instead of taking a gamble into unfettered mm -hmm. territory. You can make this exact same comparison, this exact same dynamic. Again, the like Blizzard is so similar to From Software in so many ways today. Um, there, it's a very different landscape, of course, because the MMORPG genre has been explored. But there are people out there that want like a Dark Souls MMO. And there are people out there who who they they cringe every time they hear that suggestion because they're like, hey, you know, Dark Souls is perfect. From Software is doing great what they're doing now. Screw this MMO that everybody wants, and they're they're very resistant to that, right? So you can just imagine, you know, this strategy game, the fan base of this strategy game hearing all of a sudden one day, hey, we're gonna make a completely different genre of game. We're gonna make we're gonna make a. Uh, an MMORPG, a genre at the time which was incredibly niche and nobody really cared about. Uh, the RTS genre was much bigger than the MMORPG genre in 2001 when WoW was, WoW was announced. So, I mean, you can, you can just imagine. People were like, what the hell is this? What the hell are you guys doing? Just make, just make another Warcraft. The idea of paying a monthly fee to continue playing was mm. a hard pill to swallow yes. at the time especially by Blizzard fans mm -hmm. who had grown accustomed to the one-time purchase models set standard by the company. Including my parents. This was a hard sell, okay? Any, any kid in the early 2000s will identify with me on this one. This was a hard sell to the parents. Parents at this point, they're used to, you know, they, they would take you to Blockbuster, you could rent a game there, or maybe they can just outright buy you a game, but a game that you had to pay monthly for, yeah, that was a hard sell. Work would continue on the project, however, and the very first interview would be claimed by the Computer Gaming World magazine. By this time, EverQuest was the clear reigning champion, but yep. the genre as a whole had one fatal flaw, and that's the learning curve. Mm -hmm. XP loss, gear yep. loss, and even permanent character death were commonplace in nearly every game of the genre. It's very hardcore. Look at this gamer. Play. Look at this gamer right here. Absolute Chad. It cultivated a very niche and hardcore community. And the every player hard. would quickly succumb to the intense difficulty and seek entertainment from other, more forgiving games. They're too hard. They're too hard to understand. They're too hard to play. You know, you have this genre of game that's very daunting to be thrown into this giant world um, with so much grinding required. And if you die, you like you can lose like a week of progress. They're too hard. That's what held it back, and that's what Blizzard recognized. They said, "You know what? No, we're going to make something that's a little bit more casual friendly, and you'll see exactly how in a few ways." It was a genre with a focus on character progression, with death penalties centering around character ah, regression. Uh, 
and oh. a steep learning curve yep. to go along with it. However, this transitionary period would prove to be a key moment where players for the first time would leave single player games. You guys remember the first like time this, entering Hyrule Field in the sprawling world? They were incomparable to each other, and although it's funny to think now, it was an intimidating thing. Very the time intimidating. Investment was and still is. You guys remember your high. first MMO? You had to have a computer. You had to have a good enough graphics card to run it. You had to have internet. Yep. And you had to pay a subscription. This is all expensive. The hurdles standing between the average person and the game were already high, and combined with the unforgiving gameplay of the mm -hmm. landmark titles representing the genre, it was just too much for the average person. Yeah, it was. There's there's such a huge wall. Not only is is it just a, a tough genre to get into gameplay wise, it was expensive. Computers. If you look at old magazine for like gaming computers, back in uh, early late nineties, early two thousands, these things are like three thousand effing dollars, and that's before inflation. By today's standards, like would that be the equivalent of like ten grand or something? It was. Uh, there were, there were a lot of hurdles, not just through the genre alone, but through technology at that point, consumerism. Most families at that point had one computer that you had to share with your mom and dad. Yeah, it was rough. Mammal Boys, well, thank you for the five dollars. He says, um, "Longtime fan of your videos on YouTube, watching you first watching you stream." Well, thank you. Enjoying the sod content. I'm glad to see you hitting the wild pipe again. Sod has been great, Mammal Boys, and uh, I appreciate the support there. And thank you for watching. Yeah, the old CRT monitors that you can knock people out with but it oops was this person this untapped market of new and casual players that blizzard would set their sights on world yep. of warcraft took a completely different style of approach during a time when xp loss was the bare minimum penalty for dying world of warcraft made you simply run back to your uh, mini max says that he convinced his dad that he needed a 1400 pound pc to properly print his paperwork <laughs> Nice. Well, oh, they were they were super expensive. Uh, one of the great things here is that uh, when you die and death is an inevitability in all these games, it's really not that big of a deal. All other online RPGs make death a really bad thing because dying should be bad, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in World of Warcraft, pretty much all that happens is you sit out for a bit. You get a little bit of durability loss. You run and get your corpse and you but, respawn. No, you it's not bad. Lose experience points. You don't lose your items or any of that stuff when, by by 2004 standards that was that was uh that was huge and that was also uh uh i think his name is greg cassavan speaking he used to be an interviewer for gamespot he is now the director for um super giant games who you may know uh was the creator of hades he actually uh He's he's uh, uh he runs a uh, very very successful indie game company today. You guys should look at search Greg Casavin GameSpot World of Warcraft review on YouTube. It's it's a good watch. Francois, well thank you for the tier one. Just keep up the good work. Well thank you for the support there. Hitting the max level took years in other games. World of Warcraft it took months for most players. Several months for some people. Were complicated and confusing. That's SWG right literature there. Literature to understand. Yeah. Uh, World of Warcraft systems yeah. were relatively straightforward. And when care yeah, it's like this. This, for example. Okay, you're picking up a new MMO. You're given 52 unrefundable points at character creation. Like, oh, do I want sneak attack? What is sneak attack? Do I want recklessness? What the hell is that? Mana conversion? The average player has no idea what the hell any of this is. And this this is another very, very big hurdle for new players to get into. The, like, just imagine you're playing a new MMO and you're given this. Like, how, what is good here? It required, um, and remember, this was before YouTube days where you had these full-on guides to explain everything. You, you would have to read and read and read and read and read just to figure out what the hell all of these points do and where you should put them. Like, some of these are going to be worthless, I'm sure. Uh, what game is this? I think this is a Dungeons & Dragons MMO. Like, I'm sure some of these are absolutely worthless, and you, you brick your character straight from the get-go. It's not a good feeling. It's uh, one of the reasons why talent points are first introduced at level 10. So you can kind of get a feel for the game. You're not immediately putting points into stuff. And they're, of course, also refundable. Character stat and template choices were often permanent. 
World mm-hmm. of Warcraft featured costly but reversible methods of character progression. Yep, this was new. Reverse, reversible character games, progression. Areas designed for that was new. Groups of high-level players referred to as raids, but they were commonly out in the open world, yep. which resulted in having to compete against yep. one another for kill credit. Due to you this, had to race other there guilds. Was a greater sense of urgency to complete the raid. Only one guild could get the blue. Sitting before any other guild had the chance to catch up and bring unwanted competition. Marathon sessions of guilds setting up 24-hour shifts was a common strategy to maintain dominion of these raids, in many cases to the detriment oh God. of the health of the players. This one was, yeah. Final Fantasy XI boss was engaged for 18 hours until players were forced to quit after they began to faint and vomit. Though this- <laughs> Imagine killing a boss and not even fainting during the attempt. What, what casual the genre has become these days. You don't even vomit while you're trying to kill a raid boss? Good lord, are you even playing the game? This boss in particular was nerfed shortly after the incident. This was the state of the endgame for most MMOs in these early stages. However, World of Warcraft had been one of the first MMOs yeah, it's like the rank to standardize 14 grind. instanced raids. Yeah, Meth, players Meth is and right. could create their own unique raid instances, resetting on a weekly basis. Yeah, and this, this, this was huge. Themselves. I, um, I want to say that I think EverQuest technically did this first with the Planes of Time. That uh, Correct me if I'm wrong here. EverQuest did release an instanced raid called the Planes of Time. But, um, you know, WoW was the first to standardize it private raid instances that guilds you know you don't have to camp like the the world bosses the outsword world bosses which as you know can be hyper trolled and toxic all the time having access to your own raid bosses that you can do at your own time your own schedule was uh believe it or not was a groundbreaking thing and it's it's this is standard this is standard in the genre today in some games you have outdoor world bosses but and typically, typically in MMOs, all raids and dungeons are instanced now. So you can just, hey, I want to, I want to clear molten core. Let's just do it instead of like waiting eighteen hours for Ragnaros to spawn and then getting the tag or or whatever the case was with these other MMOs at the time. It was huge. Although today seen as archaic and simplistic, at the time they were quite advanced. Yeah, it was a genre where raid bosses boiled down to having a unique name with a higher health pool and increased damage. Yeah, World of Warcraft would add unique and often at like the what time, you're seeing right now the mechanic, the the Ragnaros submerge, the Sons of Rag coming out. This was like this was extremely complicated. Today it hasn't really aged too well. It's pretty standard. Gamers have become better, obviously, at playing these games, but. 2004 standards yeah this was required teamwork and thought to overcome that was tough in turn would become one of the game's major selling and again no youtube guides and npcs but were commonly static this is also big azeroth felt more alive with dynamic npcs going about their daily lives it may seem small but like npcs patrolling around um just adding life to the world making it feel more like a world immersing the player into the world World of Warcraft was very effective at in 2004. And uh, not only that, I believe I did not mention it in this video, but going from zone to zone with no loading screen, the graphics of WoW today are quite cartoony. Um, And one of the reasons for that, and like the textures are pretty low, honestly, but one of the reasons for that was so they could fit every single zone in Eastern Kingdoms and Kalimdor. So, you know, you can go from the Elwyn Forest to Westfall without a loading screen. That also did a lot to keep the player immersed into the world. To, to almost make them feel like, like forget that they're playing a game, right? And well, I was very effective in that. Simply put, what it didn't invent, it improved. I should have mentioned that in this MMOs video. I, in I consider that an error. Almost theirs. And World of Warcraft was the first one to bridge that gap and bring it into a more mainstream audience. And it reaped the rewards because of that. Uh, original Badman says it was originally less of a game and more of an online virtual world. Absolutely, it was. It was an online virtual world with its own community. It's It was social media. World of Warcraft was one of the first... Um, one of the first widely used forms of social media. Absolutely. And it, it's also one of the... We'll get into this later. It's also one of its more addictive properties. 
The game would continue development throughout the years, with teasers being released in the form of magazine interviews and trailers, Absolutely. keeping the curious onlooker abreast on its direction. And after a long alpha and beta testing period, the moment of truth came on November 23rd, 2000. The big moment. It's time. <laughs> yep. So a lot of people are rosy, okay, about the WoW launch. I personally did not experience the WoW launch. I started playing in March of 2005, but through very simple research, you will, uh, and some surviving videos from back then, you'll see exactly what the, the launch of WoW was like. This is, this is, and this hasn't changed. Some things never changed. This is the Error 37 or whatever the hell it was with uh, Diablo 3. This is the Error 37 of 2004. Because they did not expect this. Its strategy of appealing to the casual gamer They did not well. expect such a, a little too well. such a Blizzard interest in, no in way the game. Was prepared for the frenzy of players eager to get into the world. Disconnect, lag, and rollbacks lag. would persist heavily lag. for the opening months, and still consistently through the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Forms daily would be filled with outrage. Oh yeah, for a refund, the forms were popping off. Threats of lawsuits. Yep, the forums. The the I quite liked it because when the game was down, the forums provided like their own form of entertainment. Dude, people were so mad when they couldn't. They loved this game so much. They were so mad when they couldn't play it. And there, there's, yeah, it was like threats of lawsuits. Uh, this game would be down for days at a time. Uh, these days, I think, you know, they've gotten better with maintenance and everything. But uh, back, in, back in original vanilla, it would be common for this game to be unplayable for like two, three days as uh, they, they tried to figure out their server issues, they would actually uh, give like one two-day refunds of game time to people. Or they, they would, not refunds, they would add a day or two to when they'll next be charged for a subscription because it was, it was so bad. And also Stunlock is fine, by the way. Sorry, but Stunlock is fine. I'm sure uh, not from a rogue here. The miraculous thing about it, though, is that it didn't even seem yep. to slow its growth. People didn't the care. today is looked at as disastrous. They didn't care. And still, people came back because again it was that good. Again, how can a game that's playable maybe fifty percent of the time hold such a demand? Well, it's because it was if, that good. If the game is good, launches are important. But if the game is good enough, it doesn't matter. The game could be unplayable. If people are still fiending to get in. It'll still do well. Years of development had paid off as World of Warcraft quickly became a hit, almost immediately dwarfing all competition at the time and robbing them of their player bases. It was the vampire of the MMO mm -hmm. industry at its release, and it would suck the life force. This is a very good clip coming up. Previously mentioned staple of the genre. So this this is Richard Vogel, the executive producer, and uh, Raf Koster, um, game creative slash game director of SWG. This is done in a GDC interview. I believe I have this linked in the description. Um, and they, they say first, these are the developers of the game firsthand. They had just released an expansion for Galaxies, Jump to Lightspeed, which was years in the making. Um, because it was released next to World of Warcraft, they, they saw like a bump in 200 subscribers. This expansion that was, imagine that, like a Wrath coming out, they get 200 subscribers for it or something. It did. Like, WoW was so popular, it just sucked the life force out of SWG, EverQuest, Ultima Online, Dark Age of Camelot, everything. But there was one unfortunate thing. The unfortunate thing was you see right it here? launched right when WoW launched. Right there. Yep. So WoW brought the whole industry the down. The entire industry. Not just us. Every online game out there went down as soon as WoW went out. WoW was like, a huge succubus of players went over there and drove into WoW. And it redefined the genre, too. all our numbers down. Um, I don't mention it here, but the fate of Star Wars Galaxies is very tragic. Um, it's not a story that the Jedi would tell you, but they, would, they, they eventually turned this very sandbox game into basically a, a kind of a poopy WoW clone. Because they said, oh, well, look how many subscribers WoW took from us. Let's try to get those people back and, and transform SWG into a linear World of Warcraft clone. And uh, 
It ended up not working out for him, and they fizzled out in 2012. 60 levels of progression and a world of challenges awaited the eager player base, and there would be many landmark moments just waiting to be claimed. Players rushed to the max level, and the title of the world first level 60 went to a Zenith. player named Zenith. Yep. A troll rogue on the Storm Reaver server on December 3rd, 2000. What a loser. A little less than two weeks after What a release. complete loser. By today's standards, incredibly <laughs> slow. But back then, a no life nerd. Some people just don't have a real life. True. Pressing. On January 30th, 2005, the game would see its first raid cleared True. with the death of Anixia. Taken down by the guild ruined. Nerdgasm um, incoming, server. just a warning. Many Bally players warning. for the first time got to see the famed epic quality items that she hoarded. This was the actual comms in Ventrilo or TeamSpeak or whatever. Blizzard Some, sometimes I miss that. I had many moments like that in Vanilla WoW. Um, we wiped on Twin Emperors for like three months straight. And the first time we killed Twin Emperors, it was something similar to that. Very memorable. Spend the following years perfecting their craft. As their subscriber base increased, so too did their budget. And uh, Deep Calm donated uh, for the $5 super chat. Thank you. He says, uh, when WoW came out, let me give you a little heart. WoW came out, I had to go to two Game Stops and two Best Buys to find a copy. And the last Best Buy had one left. And the install took three hours. Hey, you guys remember the disc swapping? Insert, please insert disc two, disc three. That's another thing I kind of, I'm kind of, I'm pretty nostalgic about physical media, swapping discs to install your MMO or your video game or whatever. That's something that's gone with the digital age. Um, my friend, Carlos, uh, was a little bit more fortunate. His store had copies available. And in fact, they had a collector's edition of WoW. And uh, he said that the store clerk tried to get him to buy the collector's edition and he turned him down. He was like, ah, this, I'm probably just going to play this game for a few months. It will, that, that, that collector's edition won't be worth like $20,000 sealed at some point in time. Yeah. It says it's one of his biggest regrets. Um, yeah, sealed collector's edition these days goes for a crazy amount of money. So, rip. I just, I, um, my mommy got me a normal edition, just a standard one, so no, I've never had the collector's edition either. More servers would quickly be added to support the booming player base. New patches would not only release new raid Forum tiers, troll. but also Thank you. systems, Thank items, you for the... and much more. And in up. May of the same year, the subscriber base would see its biggest surge for the next hey, decade. You know what? I don't have my alerts on here, I'm sorry. Oh God. Okay guys. I'm just going to preface this by saying when this was first released in 2005, ev most people thought this was real. Most people thought that this was real, largely due to because people just didn't really understand the game. This is uh, one of the big reasons, one of the big things that brought WoW into mainstream popularity, as you'll see. Yeah, you'll see it right here. Leroy. Originally released on Warcraft movies, probably the most viewed World of Warcraft related video of all time. If you, if you uh, accumulate all of the views between all the versions throughout the years. Uh, these eggs have given us a lot of trouble in the past. Uh, does anybody need anything off this guy? Or can we One of the this? earliest videos to go viral in the World of Warcraft was created by the guild Pals for Life. One of the, the first viral videos on how to clear out a particularly for the game. tricky room in the Upper Blackrock Spire raid. Uh, I think it's a pretty good plan, and we should be able to pull it off this time. Uh, what do you think? And this was everywhere. Every gaming community had Leroy uh, spreading yeah, around. It was viral. I'm coming up with 32.33 uh, repeating, of course, percentage of survival. Oh, that's a lot better than we usually do. Uh, All right, thumbs up. Ready, guys? Let's or... do this. Leroy Dragon. <laughs> oh my God! He just ran in. Save him! Oh gee, stick to the plane! Oh gee, let's, let's go, let's go! Stick to the plane! And in the midst of the conversation, a group member, Leroy, charges in prematurely this, with reckless um, abandon. Blizzard actually referenced this too in Warlords of Draenor. I can't move my you could get Leroy as a follower the, when they the redid UBRS if you saved him in time. Oh my god! Oh, just keep saying that! More responding! 
I don't think you can cast with that shit. Oh my god. Shut up. I got it. I got it. I got it. Come on. Come on. Stay down. This is OG oh World god. of Warcraft. And this. God damn it, Leroy. God damn it, Leroy. And this, this, um, I wanted to include. You'll see it many moments like this, community based moments, because this is one of the. You're looking at it right here, this black screen. This is one of the reasons why WoW became such a hit. It was the, it was the community moments. People, people from the outside saw this. They're like, oh my gosh, what's this? this? This looks really interesting. I've never seen anything like this before. Uh, this goes not only for Leroy, but for, for dives. Um, in a different kind of way for the Serenity Now funeral crash, for the um, the ZG blood plague incident. Um, all of these moments that were born from these online communities just intrigued the the average mainstream person. And that's that was a big part of what drew them in. So I, I made sure in this video, I wanted to pay extra, extra special attention to the Leroy Jenkins moments, to the Serenity Now funeral crashes, these these huge spectacles that went you know, virally popular and just, just made the game seem interesting. Yeah, well, Tarion says the community made the game. Absolutely. And that's, that's one of the... That's why I'm so gung-ho these days about, you know, community in MMOs is, uh, is so important. And it's harder to get stuff like this these days because the genre is no longer new. But yeah, online communities within, within the MMO are, are so important. It's one of the major reasons why WoW video took was off. later revealed to be staged, but nonetheless, it caught on like wildfire, and it was shared across multiple websites. This is Warcraft forums, movies. Wait, why am I pointing at my monitor? You guys can't see that. World of Warcraft. I'm pointing. I'm physically pointing at my monitor right now. Onlookers were intrigued. Word of mouth proved to be a prolific advertising vehicle for the game. It's hard to say today just how many people watched the video. I actually, the video I actually hunted these down. Have been lost. The original upload. This is what I was able to estimate. Today, it's it's probably more. 19 million views, and the original YouTube mirror reached at least 46 million before it was taken down. And surviving mirrors today sit at a total combined count of it's, around. I'm sure it's million. easily over 100 million. It's by far the most viewed Warcraft-related video, even to this day, yep. over 15 years later. It was so popular, in fact, that it was later featured as a question in the trivia show Jeopardy just a few months later in November. This role playing Rip Alex, game by out the way. in 2004 returns to the world and look, of Azeroth. Look at these where casuals. Like Leroy Jenkins do battle. Look at these casuals. And that would be the world of war. Disgusting. Craft. Pathetic. Yeah, pathetic. <laughs> The Leroy craze wasn't the only phenomenon uh -oh, ZG to time from the game, though. September of 2005 saw the release of the Zul'Gurub raid, the final encounter of which was a boss named Hakar. He had an ability called Corrupted yep, Blood. I remember this. Which dealt some damage to a player. This this and happened on my server, much like another, every server. It would spread to that person. In a contained environment, it's just another raid mechanic. That is, until one player, intentionally or otherwise, managed to create a virtual pandemic that spread across every single server. The mechanic had one fatal flaw. Look at this like artistry skills right here. Afflicted with the disease and then dismissing it, it would persist when the so it stays is on the path. More. This and then he did yep. just that, but <laughs> in a crowded area, and spread the affliction to every nearby player and NPC. It was amazing. And as long as living hosts. There was no escape. Entire this was cities this was COVID preparation. The plague. Circa 2005. Okay. This is equivalent to um, you know how in COVID, um, there are like people going around like intentionally sneezing on produce, uh, and like uploading that to social media and shit. This was the premonition of how of how people would react to COVID in 2005. Okay, we learned it from WoW. Word quickly spread, and other players intentionally started spreading the disease. Yep. Ironforge, Stormwind, Orgrimmar. Every major capital city was a death hub and was uninhabitable by lower level players. The spread would continue yep, to go I did on experience for days this uh, until Blizzard eventually. Uh, Wall of Sleep asked if I experienced this. Yep, I was playing the game during this time. I started in March of 2005. This is where they patched it out. And, um,. Late yeah, 2005 here. Disease, but the resulting chaos remains to this day to be one of the most memorable moments in the game's history and has even been used in real-world research of the spread and reaction of contagious diseases.
actually true. Oh god. Yeah, it's really easy to be an asshole with the keyboard and get away with it. So just how well the shit clings to the asshole. Example, as Sheeran and his band of jingleberries, you're added to the to-be-camped list. Congratulations, spelled incorrectly. You have stooped lower than any other guild in MMO history. This guy's mad. Oh, I, I don't know. This is too many swears. I would read that one. Moment. Oh my god. I don't even remember this. I hope Bashira's dad dies of a heart attack. Then at the funeral, some guy runs in naked and pushes the coffin over and runs around slapping people, screaming LOL owned, and then releases... Yeah, he's mad. Games history. Some <laughs> are more shit. controversial than others. In 2006, on the Illidan server, a player he's by mad. the name of Fajin passed away suddenly from a stroke. And that's and this in is... memoriam of one of her favorite activities, fishing. Her guild had decided to host an in-game funeral service to pay one final tribute to her. There were two problems, though. It was publicly advertised on the Realm forums, mm -hmm. and Illidan was a PvP server. I feel like, um... It's very, I, I'm sorry, it's just kind of, it's foolish. This is the internet. Maybe people didn't understand the internet back then, but it's foolish to assume, hey guys, we're going to, you know, pay tribute to our friend on a PvP server. Please nobody disrupt this event. Where players of the opposite faction could freely attack one like, another. That's playing with the fire. Serenity now saw the thread, and they felt that they would join in to pay tribute, but in a very different way. Having snuck through a nearby tunnel leading into the zone, an entire raid team prepared to crash the funeral. As players lined up to pay tribute to their friend, the raid quickly closed in on the nice location, day for a memorial. and to make matters worse, in an effort to they, role play, many of the attendees yes. had unequipped their armor. The the attendees like they got an RP sets. So they unequipped their armor, their weapons, and weapons. So they were leaving them defenseless against the surprise onslaught. It was like an Anakin versus the uh, the the child Jedi situation. Good lord, the funeral was quickly and easily dispatched. Serenity now would become infamous. Yeah, this this was this was hugely as one of the most controversial mm -hmm. in game events in its entire history. Yep. Absolutely I actually got a little bit of flack for like talking about this in a bit. Some people were mad. Um I will say that if I were to ever pass on into the afterlife, and I'm giving you guys permission, okay? And you guys host like an in-game funeral for me. I want you guys fucking destroying each other. I want PvP to happen. That sounds like a memorable spectacle. And um, today, many more people know about Fajin because solely because of this funeral crash. Yeah, if you guys ever want to throw a funeral for me, yeah, PvP like crazy. Hopefully the Alliance wins. That's what I would prefer. But you All have my permission. serve a crucial role in the telling of the history of the game, and it would serve as a reminder of the reasons why it's Absolutely. such a success. It's due not only to its own merits. I want, I want people talking about, talking about me in videos and stuff. But perhaps for years to come. drastically by the community that yep. the world of Azeroth was comprised of. This world, however, was about to change. BC time, baby. How many of Listen you to this pop. World of Warcraft? Due to the success of World of Warcraft, Blizzard for the first time held their own event. BlizzCon, the birth of BlizzCon. Around a Blizzard game. This is, um, Blizzard. sorry, hang on, let me go back. This is Alpha AB. Held their own event. You'll notice right here. It says, clear points of interest. This is the very first version of Arathi Basin. I think this is maybe, yeah, this is stables for the Alliance. There's the bridge going up to Lumber Mill, and in the middle right there is Blacksmith. So this was before Battlegrounds were released, this, this first BlizzCon. Solely around Blizzard games named BlizzCon. This was, and remains to be, a unique aspect of the developer to hold a personalized convention tailored to their products. A form of celebration of not only the games that Chris they're creating, Metzen. but also the already massive community that, was, uh, that they built. Uh, uh, I forget his focus name. focus on the community would be something that mm -hmm. Blizzard would become known for, yep. and it created a loyalty of sorts Yep, a loyalty of sorts, a loyalty of sorts that would later be abused. Never be loyal to a video game developer. Always remember, 
your relationship with video game developer is the product they put out is it worth it by uh by by giving loyalty you open up the doors for exploitation of that loyalty if you actually consider yourself to be a fan of a video game developer uh, the best thing you could do for them is to hold them to a quality standard or else what you get later on down the line is warcraft 3 reforged from the players it felt like it was more than a game it was a community of people sharing their combined love and passion for the world. Was that Jay Allen there? Jay Allen also came from Galaxies, by the way. He was a game dev for Star Wars Galaxies before he came to World of Warcraft. He actually, um, he, uh, he let the developers of SWG work in his home. They current, before they had a studio, he let them set up and work on the game in his home. Yeah, uh, Jalen Brack has ties with SWG that they created. You guys, you guys take care of us, man. You guys, you guys really take care of us. Diablo, Starcraft, but yeah, absolutely. Warcraft. Fans from around the world would plan vacations. There's this whole them. loyalty aspect of Blizzard. There still is to this day. Would meet each other in person for the first time, and BlizzCon as a whole would become a very crucial part of Blizzard's identity. I, I know people who got married. They met at BlizzCon. From this point forward. And in the very first convention, held in October of 2005, a bombshell announcement was unveiled. The World of Warcraft is about to get bigger with are the you prepared, you guys? first expansion, The Burning Crusade. You are not prepared. You are not prepared. Well, that just, like, gave me chills. Still to this day, that cinematic gives me chills. The expansion boasted what players had come to expect from the world of Warcraft and more. They would step in to the world of the Outland. Um, small little pause here. Outland was initially designed to be in Vanilla WoW. That's why you can see the original Hellfire Peninsula in the Dead Mines if you glitch through the wall. Yeah, all of Outland was designed to be in Vanilla, but they just ran out of time. They said, all right, you know what? This game's big enough. Let's save all of this for its first expansion and progress through 10 more character levels, new zones, talents, dungeons, spells, raids, races, a profession, a new PvP system, and much more. Arenas, would add Earth on of Arenas. And improve in just about every aspect of the game. But it's still 2005, and there's a lot of game left to conquer before players began worrying about their foray into the Outland. There were dragons to kill and DKP to acquire. Odd groups got to oh left, God. even groups got right. That means one, three, five, seven left, two, four, six, eight right. In the game, he had Shout casual, to vanilla rating. hardcore, <laughs> and everything in between. And there were some who took it even further beyond. No reason to lose many Angry I Raiders. Because I blame my. Um, I don't. I can fucking do it. Everyone can do it. Do it right. This is bullshit. Videos of a more serious or I, my yeah my guild kind of yeah there are moments like this in my guild as well in, in in vanilla. Angry nature would start to spring up at this point. Those of raid leaders chewing out members for failing and properly. Um, arid storm says consider your knowledge of the game. This product have you considered making a video relating to its development like as one video? Um, I think uh, I would probably just repeat a lot of what I said in Pandora. Uh, I think I kind of got. At least all of what I know through Pen, through this episode of Pandora. Performing the mechanics of a boss fight. I could look well, it into it though. Crush him was fair to it. Who the fuck was that? <laughs> Crush him? What the fuck? Welps! Left side! Even side! Many welps! Now handle it! Shoutouts to Crash him for being bad. <laughs> if Crash him didn't get tail whipped. We would never have what you're seeing right now, okay? I'm just letting you know that right now. Crashim, uh, shoutouts to Crashim. The most prolific of which. Um, the person you just heard dives. I know it's hard to believe, but he, uh, his actual profession in real life is he's, uh, he's like a drill instructor for, I think he's like in, in like Norway or something. He's he's an actual drill instructor. He, so he, he knows how to yell. Leader of the guild, guild tell. White Club. Anixia at this point had been slain by numerous guilds, and after some unsuccessful attempts, one of the members decided to record what would later become. Yeah, Anixia was pretty old at this point. History. I think Blackwing Lair was out animation. at this point, so what these the these guys were pretty bad. DKP minus! What the fuck was that shit? 
Do I explain much like DKP Leroy, here? The animation would quickly become popular. Um, DKP points, just in case you guys don't know, this is, I believe this is very archaic. I don't think anybody uses DKP these days, but uh, for killing bosses, you earned points, and then you use these points to bid on items, and whoever has the most points gets the item, and you get, sub you get sub subtracted a certain amount of points for that item. Like, so let's say... Somebody with 80 points and somebody with 70 points bids on Ishkandi. Obviously, the 80-point person wins, and then maybe 40 points are deducted as the price of Ishkandi. It was a way to dole out loot uh, based on participation. Um, and I believe it's not really used as much today. This was, uh, this was born in EverQuest, DKP. I'm actually friends with... Um, a guy who was in the guild that invented DKP, the first to use it. So, I think it's, it's uh, I believe it's not really used that much these days. At least my guild doesn't use it. They use a uh, loot console. And it highlighted the frustrating side. Of For some people, just roll. People the madness of rolling. The challenging raids. Plot hole, thank you. Like you're For the prime. fucking going through the motions. You'll get your goddamn loot eventually. Just, oh, damn it! He's mad. Yeah, I know. Uh, well, we're all going to get attacked uh, because we have no warlock no. here. Nice job, you I'm fucking running. idiot. Hey, shut the fuck up, you stupid... Rignoros. That's Rignoros. <laughs> These videos would paint players <laughs> in a much less flattering way as many people would become so obsessed that Addiction. they would shirk real-life responsibilities. Who would do that? And follow up contact with friends. Who would do that? Or school. And in the most extreme cases, Stabbed cause over, harm yeah. to themselves or others. Oh, yeah. In Korea, it gets real in 2005, sometimes. the four-month-old child of a couple would suffocate when left unsupervised for yeah. several hours as the parents were playing World of Warcraft in an internet cafe. The it, phrase World of Warcraft was World of coined, Warcraft, yep. shedding light on the dark side of video game addiction, particularly that of MMOs. Sean Wooley, this was EverQuest. Obsession, something not that well. the media was, was not shy of reporting as World of Warcraft, due to its popularity, would find itself at the center of this world or against video game addiction. Computer. Yeah, there's, I mean, this This was, um, it still happens these days, um, but yeah, especially late 90s, early 2000s, the media was very, very much against video game violence, addiction, uh, uh, news stories about Grand Theft Auto games all the time. And uh, when it came to addiction, yeah, World of Warcraft was, that's, that's what they went for. And you know, obviously, people did. The MMO genre is a very, very addicting genre of game. It's very addicting. Games. He's playing them. Dead an code, incredible thank you. 16 hours a day. His mother says his personality has changed and that he's become it's moody probably and violent. Ranking. And his addiction is tearing the family apart. He's probably ranking. It was more than a game. It was a virtual. Good point here, though. This this guy's playing like for 18 hours a day. He's in dungeon set tier zero. Cameron needs to get good, okay? You're playing 18 hours a day. You're in. You're a light forged paladin. Addiction is tearing the family apart. To many, it was more than a game. It was a Casual virtual gamers. life with the graphical interface. It attracted people from all walks of life and blended them together in the chaos of this online world. News of the Burning Crusade remained to be scarce, as it was still under NDA in the Friends and Family Alpha. A blog post teasing new features would be shared scarcely, but otherwise it was still largely a mystery outside of what was shared at the 2005 BlizzCon. The um, BC in a lot of ways kind of killed raiding in vanilla. I remember once BC was like getting closer and closer to release, uh, raid participation would, would suffer, within my guild at least. Yeah, people stopped showing up because it was like, um, you know, all of these items are going to be replaced. The level cap's getting increased to 70, and it was kind of common knowledge that all of this raiding gear you'd replace with questing gear for the most part. So um, I'm sure this still happens today, but yeah, I remember very clearly that uh, people kind of tuned out up to the release of uh, BC. Excitement was palpable, and players from all over the world couldn't wait to get into the Outland. The beta test for the expansion started not too long after, 
as players got to discover and explore its features. And shortly after, oh, Warcraft yes, would yes. become the focus of the cartoon series South Park yes. with their Make Love Not Warcraft episode. This was huge. The episode detailed the boys' fight against the hacker antagonist and their struggle oh, with God. video game addiction. Though on release, it was an instant success. Many years later, series co-creator Trey Parker what gamers. detailed his worries with the episode, revealing that he even tried to get it pulled mm -hmm. as he feared that it simply wasn't funny. Yeah. But as history has shown, the episode would become he, he, an he went through success. Um, and he actually went through like a major depressive episode. He thought this episode, Make Love Not Warcraft, was like the death of South Park. This is, this is where people were going to point to where South Park is poopy. But um, I think it's the second most popular episode, like the second most watched behind Scott Malkinson Eats His Parents. Despite the fact that the series at this point... Or Scott, no, not Malkinson, Scott Tennerman must die. Yeah, where Cartman tricks him into eating his parents. Now has over 300 episodes. It this is just an IMDb rating. This isn't like official at all, but... To be one of their most popular to this day. Looks like you're about to get pwned. Yeah, a lot of that. Um, I think a lot of the animations was actually done by Blizzard in house at Blizzard. I think they they kind of coordinated with the South Park team quite a bit, from what I understand at least. Hey, gaming nicer. Thank you. January sixteenth finally came, and it marked the beginning of. The I want to go back era. to that. Look at this like horde, this horde of locusts here. This is something you don't get these days. With digital releases, there's no more lines. There's no more big opening events. Like, how amazing was this? Everybody's storming the, the front doors. January 16th finally came, and it marks Stamped the beginning each of other the new like era, Lion King. the official end of vanilla World of Warcraft. People lined up outside of stores and tents in the freezing cold. Launch parties were held, and the community was kid with his dad. Ever and pulled together with their one shared trait, their fear of women, or, <laughs> I mean, their collective love for the game. Of course. At this point, it had amassed roughly 8 million subscribers. So I'd like to remind you, the most subscribed MMO up until WoW was EverQuest at 10,000. And I, well, probably more than 10,000. On release, EverQuest was 10,000. Here we are, just surpassing like 8 million here, by the heading into BC. Release never once reporting a loss, and holding on to the lion's share of the market. In the background stirred some serious competition, mm, however. Warhammer. Mythic Entertainment, who developed the Dark Age of Camelot, sought to compete against Blizzard with the Camping out, RPG gaming maps, interviewing the Q line, good old yeah, Minimax, series, for sure. Due to its similar fantasy setting, holding orcs, magic, elves, and wizards, many thought it to be the direct competitor to World of Warcraft, and deemed it to be one of the first of many would-be WoW killers during the time. Another such game. Oops. Um, the only thing that'll kill WoW will be WoW. Blizzard will either kill WoW by just releasing bad expansions consistently, or they'll release WoW 2, and, you know, people won't really play WoW 1 as much. Um, that's what I believe. All of these WoW killers come out, these or these purported WoW killers. Warhammer will kill WoW. Age of Conan will kill WoW. Um, Aeon will kill WoW. The only thing that'll kill WoW will be Blizzard. And was the Age of Conan, the Hyborian Adventures. I played all of the WoW Conan, killers, who is pretty much. known in the MMO community for Anarchy Online I played AOC. in 2001. Its selling points would be impeccable graphics at the time and a new and fresh combat system in a dark and visceral world featuring the fatality mechanic where players could execute each other in that crap. brutal fashion, often described as the mortal combat of MMORPGs. This was like the adult, the adult MMORPG Age of Conan. Let me go back here. Each other Rips off his effing head. So this, this is kind of an interesting dynamic. Uh, I like to make... When I talk about Age of Conan, I like to talk about Street Fighter versus Mortal Kombat back in um, the 90s. Street Fighter was like the big uh, SNES. Or it was released in arcades. Let's not bring consoles into the discussion, but you had two like really big fighting game genres, Street Fighter versus Mortal Kombat. Um, and I've always thought that Street Fighter 2 specifically 
was far and wide superior. It played way better than Mortal Kombat, but Mortal Kombat was still popular solely due to its violence and its fatalities and stuff. Like Mortal Kombat, everybody was pretty much a clone of each other. And Street Fighter, like Ken and Ryu were clones, but Mortal Kombat, everybody had like that uppercut, the, the Fists of Fury move, the sweep. Yeah, Street Fighters, as a game, gameplay-wise, is so superior than Mortal Kombat, but um, video game violence was like this huge taboo thing back in the day, and that's, that's one of the reasons why it became popular. And they're uh, trying to recapture that with Age of Conan here. I think I, I liken World of Warcraft to the Street Fighter, and I liken Age of Conan to Mortal Kombat. Brutal in that fashion. Way. Often described as the Mortal Kombat of MMORPGs. And the Lord of the Rings Online by Turbine. This should have been huge, by the An way. MMO of one of the most celebrated franchises in nerd culture history. Certainly posed yeah. as a serious threat to Blizzard at the time. Yeah, Lord of the Rings Online should have been amazing. It just played like crap. In my opinion, the gameplay of Lord of the Rings, it just didn't feel fun to play. But, I mean, this huge, huge, huge IP of... Uh, I say I don't say this in a disparaging way of a bunch of nerdy people for a nerdy genre of game. The Lord of the Rings really had the potential if they if they nailed it to take down WoW, but I don't know. It just didn't feel fun to play. Like it didn't feel smooth. It didn't feel satisfying to play as WoW. Um, one of the, I I didn't mention it in this video, but one of the reasons why WoW became so successful is just it feels good. The gameplay feels good. It feels really nice to crit somebody with a mortal strike or to set up a, an aimed shot or some or something. The the combat was so finely tuned in WoW that uh, you really only learned to appreciate it once you played games like Lord of the Rings Online, though these or Warhammer or Age of Conan contenders would be far off from release. The competition was beginning to get fierce, and to stave them off. The Burning Crusade had to be as exceptional as its predecessor. Yeah, it's responsive. Months that's in months of doom saying. Was that's the word I was looking for. Mahavis, uh, Mahavish, Mahavishnu Game says, while gameplay is still the most responsive. That's a good word for it. It just feels really responsive and fun. To the test, did the Burning Crusade kill the World of Warcraft? Of course, the answer is no. The expansion was a major success, and the subscription base rose even more rapidly yep. as players explored the dangerous reaches of the outbound. WoW would not be the stopped. The classes evolved, and the gap between them was lessened while still retaining the features that made them special. The raids were more challenging. The balance was the better. Was more complex. The raids were expanded more to conquer to the more raid mechanics. Base. It was just and more. Scene it was vanilla, but more. To be even more difficult for players than difficult what they had rating scene. Yeah, absolutely. Game. With many lists, Burning today, Crusade rating up Burning for a brutal. Burning Crusade bosses as the hardest in the game's history, even over 14 years later. With some yep. of them going unkilled by 99% of the player base until Blizzard intervened themselves to make them easier. The expansion today yeah, was brutal. is remembered for having an extensive process for gaining entry to the raids. The attunement. attunement. This is huge. You guys have quests. You have experience with this with uh, AC Classic. And players would rarely find themselves with nothing to do. The PvP system had evolved to be more arena. competitive with the new arena mode. Which led to um, eSports Arena, battle, which I know hasn't been the most successful though. Death, setting the stage for future competitive events yep. in Blizzard's attempt to gain a foothold into the growing eSports scene. The Alliance, for the first time, got to experience a new class to them. I, I thought, I felt like this is, um, I don't actually like this. I felt like Alliance having Paladins and Shamans having Horde is a, is, I think that's a cool, interesting, unique aspect of the game. I think it separates the factions. I think this would be an example of sacrificing something cool and unique for the impossible, perfect balance that Blizzard kind of strives for. It is what it is, right? It happened. And BC is a great expansion, but I uh, I feel like having faction-specific classes is is kind of cool. The shaman. I just like it. For the horde, it makes it more paladin, interesting. Both with two new races added to the game. It it gives it charm. I feel like one of the the things that drew people into WoW is that it had it had charm. I think holding on to I think charm is is very underestimated. In uh, gaming in general, blood elf. charm is usually I, charm is usually sacrificed for balance. 
um, and uh, optimizations. And I, I think it's, it's sort of a, uh, you know, seeing the forest through the trees situation. It's easy to lose sight of the charm that your game offers in this scramble for like perfect balance, homogenization. I think that's a good example there, the Pali versus Shaman debate. Sorry, let me, I, I paused a bunch. Let me go back here. And both with two new races added to the game. The Draenei and Draenei the Blood Elf. And the the Blood Elf Five yep. Man Dungeons rose back to the forefront with the advent of the more challenging heroic difficulty. Heroic the dungeons were cool. Was packed with features I'm a fan of tough five man content. And stands as one of That's why I like most Mythic Plus. Acclaimed releases even to this day. The Lord of the Rings also saw its release in 2007. I played this a service competition for World of Warcraft. And I played Lord of the Rings. I got relatively high level. I definitely didn't hit max. Um, I was kind of getting bored of it, and the tipping point for me was that I, I clicked, I was like inviting somebody to a party or something, I right-clicked their name, and normally what you would expect when you right-click somebody's name, invite, duel, whisper, report, um, would you ever guess Mary? I right-clicked somebody's name, and I accidentally proposed to them, and this person, for some reason accept the proposal. And then I had to go through this like really long process. I had to like Google trying to figure out how to get divorced. I'm not sure who kept the kids. I don't remember if I lost half my shit, but after that I quit Lord of the Rings online. And although receiving favorable reviews at the time. It but it, it wasn't due to that. It was, I just, I thought the gameplay was bad. It didn't feel fun to play. Compared to the size and scope of WoW, selling under 200,000 copies in the first months of release and dwindling shortly thereafter. The game does yeah. still run today, supported by a niche community, and is hovering mm -hmm. around 40,000 active players at the time of this video. I'm not sure what so, it is now, but I believe Crusade it's still running. On undaunted, and in the following BlizzCon in August, the next expansion, The Wrath of the Lich Thank King, you, Lars. was announced. Wrath announcement. The, this you you have to you have to understand like the the aura at the time. This is one of the most popular phenomenal cult cultural icons ever. You're coming off of Vanilla World of Warcraft into Burning Crusade, which people loved, into Wrath. Like people were so effing excited for Wrath, it was insane land of Northrend, where they had once visited in the events of Warcraft 3. Absolutely here, crazy. They would face the amount of hype around Wrath was Menethol insane. The Lich King. Ten more levels, a new class, the Death hey, Blue Line, Frosties, thank new you, man. zones, and siege vehicle combat were just a few of the many new features teased at the convention. And due to the success of the Burning Crusade, there was little question if it would be just as good. You were there for that announcement, says that? Nice. And on the one-year anniversary of the release of the Burning Crusade, World of Warcraft hit a landmark 10 million subscribers, absolutely dwarfing yep. any new and record. all competition. And also the as well, look at this headline. Absolutely. Making it the 82nd biggest country in the world, based off of subscriptions. Isn't that insane? Absolutely dwarfing any and all competition. The up-and-coming contender, The Age of Conan, saw its release in May of 2008, and it, received generally positive sucked. reviews by the media, and had sold it sold over incredibly buggy. copies by the end of its release month. Though ultimately, the game had failed to retain this impressive surge of subscribers. Although reviewers worldwide had praised the game, the player base condemned it yep. as being unfinished. Never listen to reviews. Mainstream reviews quickly declined. And just one well, I'm sure there's later, good ones out there, but Funcom would perform a fatality on yeah. 31 out of its 42 servers. Much what I what I remember from Age of Conan, this game was so buggy on its release, I had to delete a folder every like five minutes or else the game would crash. It had like a memory leak and you had to manually alt tab out and delete a freaking folder. Cause if you did, this was, this happened with everybody, it would crash. It was completely broken on release. And I, I wouldn't say that that's the reason why it failed. I just think that, you know, it, it didn't, it didn't have that charm. It didn't have the polish that WoW had ultimately, but yeah, the launch certainly didn't help it. Much like the Lord of the Rings online, the game still holds a dedicated yet niche following by and large falling short of being Two the wall killer up. that many predicted Three, that it would be. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, 
Oh. In July, <laughs> in a bombshell announcement at the height of the game's popularity, Activision the and the Vendi can be resisted no yep. longer as Blizzard's parent company. This is where having loyalty to a developer becomes a bad thing. Company Vivendi announced a merger with Activision, already having gained a reputation Sierra, for excessive Rip monetization Sierra. and driving franchises and developers to an early grave. All of those, words all those developers the saw died at the shortly same after Activision true for their beloved franchises, including the World of Warcraft, along with EA. These Nostradamuses, 2008 gaming. I was one of them. Uh, shortly after the release here, I framed this uh, very perfectly here. Shortly after the the uh, the merger is when you guys first saw your uh, your cash shop stuff being added. You saw the pets first, and then it was a race change and faction change after that, I believe, shortly after the merger. I was one of those people back then saying, you know, this is, uh, this is the beginning. Today's pets, uh, uh, next day are... are um, well, eventually you'll be able to, and they, they're very adamant about it at first. They said, these are just cosmetics and you will never, ever, ever in a million years be able to buy any forms of character progression. And obviously here we are today. You can buy, you can buy WoW tokens and boosts. And they would gain the reputation basically all forms of, of character progression. the player base to the fullest extent. Yeah, the, and the supply drops in Call of Duty were like really bad. Shops and pay to win game design. And just point. one year later, in September of 2009, faction Activision change. Blizzard would release the paid faction there change service. And one month after that, race the paid change. race change service, along with in -game. The slope is slippery. The slope is slippery indeed. Game collectible pets. These services were seen by many as an affront on the integrity of the game. And although not terribly impactful by themselves, it was believed that they would serve as a gateway for more damaging paid services to be introduced later. In September of 2008, yep. the release date for the Wrath of the Lich King and as history has shown, set in stone for November of the same year. Just as it was back in 2006, the clock began to... Um, Wrath of the Lich King is actually my favorite expansion, but you'll notice that although Wrath isn't when the player base started to decline, it was the expansion where the player base stopped growing. Look at the subscriber chart for World of Warcraft, and you'll notice it was during Wrath is when you see the first uh, flat line. Neither, not decreasing, but not increasing either. It was Wrath. A lot of people, um, you know, say Cataclysm was like the first, was the beginning of the end, but I, th I think it was that, I think it was that moment is when you started to see that shift. You started to see the train slow down. It peaked. Yeah. Looking for players. As far as subscriber base is concerned, in the Burning Crusade, before the content was made to be irrelevant, and due to the difficulty of the rating scene in general, they had their hands full. There was quite a long drought between the final patch of the Burning Crusade and the launch of Wrath. Nearly eight months. That's but a lot, but didn't seem to mind due to the success and lingering challenge that the expansion had to offer. Part, yeah, part of the reason was that is people just loved BC, and BC raids were very hard. So, you know, people were still progressing. They they weren't really... Uh, um, this is actually... This is uh, one of the downsides of having easier difficulty in raiding is that drots become more... They, they become more damaging to the game because more people can see and complete all of the content. So they're left... They're left hungering and fiending more for patches and content and stuff. But, um, you know, of course, BC, there's one difficulty mode, normal rating, that was it. B uh, Wrath is when they started adding heroic mode and uh, later Cataclysm LFR and then Pandaria Mythic. And I think, so today, I haven't played current WoW since early Shadowlands, but I believe it's LFR, normal, heroic, and mythic. And it's more accessible, but almost to its detriment in a way because these uh, content drops become more damaging because people, they run out of stuff to do earlier. Those who thought otherwise, though, sought to fill in this void with the release of the highly anticipated Warhammer, Warhammer Online, which saw its release in September. But was it enough to succeed where the Lord of the Rings Online and Age of Conan failed? Shoutouts to EA. 
The game saw similar numbers to The Age of Conan, selling 1.2 million copies at launch and starting off with a solid Good launch. subscriber base of 800,000 players. It was a great launch, similar to but they, they just couldn't hold it. It simply wasn't ready. It, Performance issues I, overshadowed what could have been a great experience. Like, look at this gameplay. This that that, It looks so... Look. custom to World of Warcraft's finely tuned and polished combat system immediately noticed the lack of fluidity yeah. with its gameplay. It just looks bad. It, in my opinion, it played bad, but it just looks bad. You can just tell from the footage how clunky this is. This is you, you only really appreciated the responsiveness of WoW gameplay until you played these other MMOs. My experience with Warhammer Online, I want to mark this down in this React here. Um, I'm, I've said this on stream before, but I'll say it again. So my experience with Warhammer Online, I played the good guys, the order. I got to like max level or near max level. Um, and my, my friends picked up the game like uh, at a later point. I tried to convince them to play it at first. They were like, ah, no, that game looks stupid. After I got this high level character, then they picked it up, but they didn't. I was on a PvP server, and Warhammer had the same rule as WoW, to where you could not roll both factions on this on a PvP server. So they wanted to be the bad guys, the chaos. And I was I, I was I was brought up with a tough choice. I could either okay keep this character that I put all this time into, but play pretty much by myself. I didn't have a guild or anything, or I could delete it and reroll and play with my friends. I decided, eh, well. It does suck to level again, but I will be leveling with my friends and I'll be playing with them and raiding and stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this character and make a chaos dude. Um, my character's name was Bajina. Very important to mention. It's from Basketball, which is a movie by Matt Stone and Trey Parker, creators of South Park. It's uh, about that one scene where they, they try to psych out the guy by saying, How to speak Australia. Bajina. So I had a character named that, and I deleted him to play with my friends. One week after doing that, all my friends quit. So I'm left in this dilemma. I deleted this character for basically no reason now, so I made another character, and I paged a GM, asking them, you know, explaining the situations. Hey, I basically got completely screwed by my friends. I deleted this character. Can you, can you remake him for me? Um, and... The GM says, yeah, sure, let me go ahead and look into it. They have problems. Their character res restoration servers service is down. It takes them like 30 minutes to get back to me. He says, yeah, hey, I'm not sure what's going on, but we can't. We were unable to restore your character. I say, okay, well, okay, maybe let me just make another ticket. Maybe that GM just didn't know what he was doing. Same thing. Takes He says, okay, yeah, we can, we can do that. I can restore your character, bro. Just hold tight. 30 minutes pass, same thing. Our services are down. For some reason, it's not working. Make a ticket tomorrow. At that point, I'm pretty defeated. I'm like, okay, I guess, you know, maybe I'll just make a ticket tomorrow or a few days from now. Maybe their crap will be fixed. I get disconnected. I try to log back, log back in. I've been suspended. I check my mail. And this GM, who not only failed to help me, for the name of the character that was deleted... He decided to suspend my account for like three days. It was at that point that I stopped playing Warhammer Online. Yeah, that was my Warhammer Online experience. So I didn't, uh, I almost got to max level. I would have liked to play it. I, I was, I didn't like the combat too much, but I was enjoying it enough to keep playing. But I quit after that. Additionally, the game would suffer from major scandals. Oh, this was huge too. Yep. Charging subscribers for years of game time. This was huge. Day, with some racking up charges and overdraft fees into the thousands. Yeah, they there's a bug or something. You can see here, 12:43, 13 a.m., 12 a.m., 12 a.m., uh, 25 a.m. They, for a number of accounts, they like charged for like 10 years of subscriptions. Overchar overdrafting their bank accounts. They're like, what the fuck? That was that was a big uh that was a big controversy as well. Similar to I the age that. of Conan, Warhammer failed to retain this early surge of players, and servers were shut down, and the subscriber base dropped even lower than that of their two thousand and one MMO, the Dark Age of Camelot. The yeah. game officially shut down in 2013, but many deemed it to be truly dead just one year after its release. 
there's private servers for Warhammer that you can play on, but yeah, it's it's not officially supported. Um, interesting to note though, they're trying again. I believe Mythic is making another Warhammer Online MMO. Apparently. Shortly after the Wrath of the Lich King expansion saw its release, and Blizzard would once more break sales records, players charged into Northrend with new zones to explore, dungeons and raids to conquer, and a new class to discover. The Death Knight. The Death Knight was completely overpowered, more. by the a way. A lot more. Way too much in yeah. fact, because many saw them to be far too powerful on release. There's actually a, a conspiracy theory that Blizzard intentionally made Death Knight so freaking broken solely to sell expansions. So people fight against them in battlegrounds or play with them, um, you know, during the BC part of the game to see how ins insanely broken they were. People throw out an entire arena season due to how overpowered these mofos were. They were tanks, healers, and DPS wrapped into one. Who would later be tuned down in upcoming patches. Yeah, there was so Replayability was amplified as the achievement system was implemented and players could collect points, I right, see many max mounts, and more through this new feature aimed towards completionists. Yeah, achievements and wrath. Positive reviews of its many new features and improvements and the subscriptions continued their upward trend, eventually 12 million. peaking at yep. 12 million. That's where it peaked. Just as with the Burning Crusade, it seemed to be unstoppable, though it would be where the first sign of weakness showed. Through the numbers that have been made public, there wasn't a single moment where Wrath had lost subscriptions between reports, but it was also the first expansion where they had stopped yep. gaining subscribers. You have a little tiny bump here. To 12 million throughout but you, you could see, like right here, Steady, 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 steady increase, steady increase. Didn't lose subs, but peak. Stagnation. Um, I, I, I love Wrath as an expansion, but I think, I think this is where you could say where the issue started. And, and part of this is going to be to, due to a really big drought between ICC and Cataclysm. They did do the Ruby Sanctum raid in between, but you know, it was just a one dragon raid, but... Um, I think, you know, due to uh, the multiple difficulty setting, which we just talked about, the normal raids being made to be fairly easy and the challenge being shifted over to heroic, I think the drought of wrath was much more damaging than Burning Crusade, and I think you have the subscriber chart to support that. Look, Burning Crusade here had a, a big drought. It's still uh, increasing wrath here, though. You know, you, you see some of that stagnation. I think this could be reflected in maybe uh, the downsides of of more accessibility within the end game content the course of people the got bored and as shown it wasn't due to any of these would be yeah. wild killers it, it wasn't like and some I other just... game taking away it wasn't like warhammer came out and just like drained the subs wow was still number one at this point of the same year the rating scene expanded in a big way this is a uh, yeah. tier for the expansion for the sure mode the crusader would release with the heroic difficulty setting we're going to get into this. Uh, I have to go to the bathroom, though. Give me uh, like a minute, you guys, and I'll, I'll be right back, okay? Okay, we're 40 minutes through. How long have we been streaming? Two hours, oh my God. Two hours for 40 minutes. That means to finish this video, we're 30% completed. It's, this is gonna be a six hour react to a two hour video. Previously, if players saw an extra challenge with the encounters, they could impose boss specific hurdles or restrictions upon themselves for bonus loot, achievements, and bragging rights. Players yep. would now instead toggle this option. This is hard mode. Setting. First hard mode Before was Alduar, actually. And every boss within would deal more damage, pressing the button, damage, and gain extra mechanics in exchange for better quality loot. 
this, along with the mythigrating mode to be introduced later, would become a landmark change in the core design of the game, aimed to increase accessibility by yep. greatly lowering the base normal difficulty and funneling those seeking a greater challenge into this optional difficulty setting. This change in design would and, later. Um, there, there's certainly good things with that, but I think it's, I think it's uh, short-sighted to say it's only good. I think, um, you know, there's there are bad aspects to that too. It's good and bad. Be accelerated in the next expansion, the Cataclysm, which would be unveiled in BlizzCon 2009. That will very literally change the face of the world of Azeroth as you know it. True. Show us. <laughs> so excited. This is like the Ark of the Covenant being opened for nerds. The world of Azeroth was about to change for good, as the entire old world was deemed to be outdated by 2009 standards. This expansion's villain, and here we are with Catac with a classic, Kingdoms classic releases, Calendor, reshaping them visually and mechanically by reworking each quest. Players would be able to complete all makeover of these changes from the comfort of their flying mounts, which were now enabled in the old world. Two new yep. races, the Worgen for the Alliance and the Goblin for the Horde, would also make their debut, as well as a reworked talent system. The game was to go yeah, over just its a biggest makeover to date, complete and whether makeover. it was for the better or worse was yet to be seen. Some, something you guys will be able to re-experience here with um, Cataclysm Classic. Or March the month of another Hallmark feature being added to the game, the Dungeon Finder. No longer did players have to travel the world to run to their favorite dungeons, as this tool match makes them together and teleported the party directly to the entrance. At the time, Another, this feature was received with overwhelming I'll, I'll let myself positive talk feedback here. and a welcome quality of life improvement. Though restricted to players only on their server at the time of its launch, it would later be opened up to other servers, which had the unintended side effect of alienating the community from each other. Mm -hmm. Previously, having to manually form this groups is classic footage rather as a critical and natural way for players to meet one another and make friends, and they would soon learn the downsides of automating the process. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh it's good and bad, right? There are good aspects to it, more accessibility, but you lose a little bit of that charm. You lose you lose a little bit of your server community by doing that. Um, the game feels less like an online virtual world because you don't have as close of a tie with the community. Um, I think that, you know, dungeon finding eventually kind of became a necessary evil because as you'll see with Cataclysm, the, the subscriber base started to wane. So I think eventually it was sort of a choice of, okay, dungeon either with people from not your server, for people from other servers or no one because, you know, the servers were, were dying. I think the same is true with, um, I think I mentioned it here in the video, the same is true with cross-realm zoning, is it's sort of like a necessary evil. It's, it's a band-aid fix for a larger problem of the game losing subscribers. But, you know, you, you lost something big in that transition. You lost the sense of community that uh, you used to have uh, from, from uh, Vanilla World of Warcraft 2. Cataclysm by handling the formation of the group automatically, social hey, interaction was Nick replaced with Thank you, convenience, man. and the social the aspect one. critical to MMO gameplay suffered as a result. By itself, yep. this negative impact of the system would remain relatively minor, but in the coming years, yeah. players would notice it, it was... the trend of eliminating these critical social structures mm -hmm. in the name of convenience and at the cost of the game's sense of community, yep. which many claim to be one of the biggest features to which it owed its success. Like, would, would, have, would Leroy Jenkins have happened if Dungeon Finder were in vanilla? Would there even be a need for the guild Pals for Life to group with each other and to form a UBRS rate if everybody could just queue up. You know, this, this goes back into uh, what I established earlier. This is where we have a tie here, where we're going over Leroy, uh, you know, Dives, Funeral Crash, the ZG, Blood Plague Incident. The community it was one of the biggest charms, one of the biggest reasons for the success of WoW. So, you know, I feel like um, even though they are a necessary evil, uh, Cataclysm is really, really when, you know, you started to see the community aspect of the game really take a big hit.
Oh no. Real I yeah, this was huge controversy. One of one of the, the community, one of the first major controversies that I recall, the real ID change. Would also see changes outside of the game. In July of 2010, Blizzard unveiled their new Real ID system, where they're supporting forums for all of their games. This is insane. Just World of Warcraft. By today's would no longer standards. display character names when posting, but rather real names tied to the account. Yep. Players and onlookers alike reacted with concern. Of um, I think today, over time, you kind of people have more kind of uh, they understand the value of privacy, and. Uh, you know, personal information within the world of social social media with all the crazy stuff that happens with, you know, doxing and swatting and, you know, just to name a few. But uh, by 2010 standards, um, you'll see that people were still in tune to it here. There's a lot of pushback against it, rightfully so. Protect your personal information. Absolutely. There's, are you kidding me? I have personal experience with this. You think that people won't go like absolutely ballistic on you for like making a forum post or sharing your opinion over a video game? A Blizzard's disregard of basic privacy rights, deeming yeah. that their actions would essentially dox the entire forum community. Doxing is the act of unearthing someone's personal information, yep. such as their You'll name see what or address, too. with the ultimate goal of real life harassment. Today, the advent of swatting shows the repercussions of those whose personal information was leaked. Yep. For a company to do the work for them was seen as extremely dangerous. Imagine like saying Cataclysm sucks and getting swatted because of that. Flame wars and online disputes, past, present, and future, would serve as vessels for real life harassment, they argued. They stated that yeah, there was going to be retroactive. The they were going to change like past forum posts to to switch your character's name to your real name. It wasn't even new posts. It was it was the old ones too. To cut down on forum trolling, their logic being that if someone's real name was tied to their post, they'd think more carefully about how they treat others, and that quote yeah. removing the veil of anonymity typical to online dialogue will contribute to a more positive forum environment. They're right. The less anonymous people are the less of a keyboard warrior they will be but uh this yeah this is not the way to go about it this is a huge invasion of privacy and connect the blizzard community in ways that they haven't been connected before i don't want to be connected with strangers on the internet put it to the test and in yeah. an effort to quell the player's fear he posted his real life name within one day this players found and published his address phone number age and took to placing false pizza orders in his name and even placed death threats it was at this point he realized he fucked up connecting him with the community in ways that he's never been connected before shortly yeah, after you guys Michael wanted to be connected with Blizzard, the community Mike morheim stepped in and announced that they had rescinded their plans of publishing the players real names in yeah, October, it, Blizzard pinned down a release date off for the Cataclysm expansion, eventually, rightfully December so. 7th of the same year, and despite the controversy, the game in October would reach its peak subscriber count of 12 million. The holidays came, and the Day of Reckoning was at hand, and the World of Warcraft would suffer Cataclysm in more ways than one. In addition to the retuned Old World, the talent system would also see an overhaul, altering the traditional freeform three tree talent system into specializations. Yep. Players would be forced to pick just one and lose access to many spells iconic to the other two. The trees as a whole would also be simplified and the amount of points to invest reduced. Class and item balance in general would also be at the forefront of changes in the expansion, mostly through the form of removal. Spell ranks were removed. A lot of and pruning all abilities now just had one rank that scaled with your level, and were trained automatically. And this much is more. the cat cataclysm was yeah. Um, I always say that I'd probably say this in this video. I feel like cataclysm was when the RPG and MMO RPG became lowercase. So many removed RPG features in cataclysm. I think I think uh, you know it was this point where you can say that a lot of the charm of the game was homogenized out in a lot of ways.
Cataclysm expansion is seen by many to mark the point oh, here where you go. the RPG and MMORPG there it is. was made to be lowercase, as yep. it transformed into a much simpler version of an already straightforward game. Yeah, it was already World of Warcraft comparatively. It was already straightforward away from its social and RPG. Roots, Thank you, amazing. A community of private server players would grow larger yep. and larger with each expansion. So private servers have existed since vanilla WoW, but it was Cataclysm when you had these huge, 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 huge changes changes uh, typically through the removal of RPG that's when these private servers really started to gain uh, notable populate popularity and they started to get really big independent groups to very important past in the history of, of the game of the game the most prolific of which being of its original state referred to as vanilla though its beginnings were humble this is nostalgia server community would eventually grow large enough shut down. to become a problem for blizzard and they would find themselves embroiled in legal battles to protect their ip from infringement and would eventually yep. influence a major developed project many years later um it's easy to look at blizzard as like a bad guy with shutting down these private servers but it's not that simple you know they're they're a publicly traded triple-a video game developer if they're not protecting their eye they're legally obligated to protect their ip if they don't do that they can be sued by shareholders i mean of course if, if you let um ip infringing versions of your game run free that's going to uh in an in a way negatively impact the actual retail version of the game so um it seems draconian and you know i'm not i'm not one to like throw myself in front of traffic for blizzard but it they are legally obligated to shut down the servers i think that i think the best compromise is what they ended up doing is um releasing classic versions of the game themselves the big problem was when they said like it was impossible to release vanilla world of warcraft or to release classic but they're still shutting down the ip that's when a lot of bad blood was happening because it was like, you know, you, the only version of the game that you could play is our version. You, you better take it or leave it. But, um, you know, eventually, after the Nostalgia shut down, they worked on Classic. And then introduced level boosts and WoW tokens. But that's another story. We'll get to that. Regardless, they showed once more that they had no difficulty. Pokemon, in yeah, actually. Expansions. Pokemon in the same world as Palboat, says uh, Gaburge is true, actually. As once again... They broke their own sales record with Cataclysm, selling a staggering 3.3 million copies. WoW has never had a problem Blood selling, as far as I know. They had not seen an overall increase in subscribers post-release, instead remaining steady at the 12 million mark it had been stuck at since the beginning of 2009. And for the first time since its inception in 2004, the World of Warcraft would see a loss in reported yep. subscribers. In I, I will say... So the quality of the game, uh, or at least the subscribers of the game, um, takes a downturn here. But WoW has never had a problem selling expansions until, I believe, Dragonflight? Correct me if I'm wrong here. Dragonflight is, didn't sell too well, from what I understand. They didn't release any numbers, but I believe uh, every expansion broke previous expansion sales records. Except Dragonflight. Dragonflight undersold, I hear. In fact, Cataclysm would fail to gain subscribers in a single reported quarter in its near two-year run, discounting the release of the next expansion, The Mists of Pandaria, which would be announced in October. Yeah, players even bought WAD. Yo, WAD sold like crazy, Warlords of Draenor. Oh boy. Kung Fu Panda. The initial reaction would be very mixed. The theme of the expansion was so unexpected that many thought it to be an out-of-season April Fool's joke. I players did. I was one of those players. The mysterious world of Pandaria with a new race, the Pandaren, and a new class, the Monk. Dungeons were getting a special challenge mode to bring relevancy once more to five-man content, and scenarios would be queuable micro-dungeons designed for three players, and the pet battle system Pokemon. was also implemented, a minigame reminiscent of the popular Pokemon franchise. As for the talent system, yeah, where talents, it would be simplified talents were simplified into yep. the tier system, offering more impactful choices, but at a reduced quantity of just six points to invest. Um, the reasoning for this is that the talent trees, understandably so, were getting huge at this point. Because you'd get one talent point per level, so they're kind of getting out of hand. That's why uh, 
they did this uh, one, two, three, six tier talent system in Mists of Pandaria. But um, yeah, very less, very uh, just another thing that's less RPG like. Maybe they went a little bit too far, I would say, with this. It's not enough choices. It's one talent point every 15 levels just doesn't, it doesn't feel like enough. You don't feel like you're progressing as much through the leveling and, and whatnot. And that was my take controversially, on controversially, cross realm zones would eventually be implemented. Yeah, cross -realm. Players of differing realms would be able to see and interact with one another. Due to the falling subscriber base brought on by the Cataclysm, there were Low. far too many servers running for the dwindling player base, and as a result, the worlds were starting to become barren. By grouping servers together, Blizzard aimed once more to breathe life into the world of Azeroth. While many looked at the expansion as something new and fresh, many more would be immediately turned off by its aesthetics and- I, I will say as well, I mentioned this I think like yesterday or a couple streams ago, cross realm merging it was also done for optics. A lot of the times the perception of the player base of an MMO is more important than the actual player base of an MMO. And it's much more it's much it's much better optics instead of shutting down, you know, a hundred servers than to merge a hundred servers together. Um that's part of the reason why cross realm zoning or merging without merging them, right? They they stay as their own servers, but you can see people from other servers. Um I think that uh, you know, again, it's another necessary evil feature that was implemented into the game. And uh, optics-wise, that was the best way to handle it. Because if people feel like the MMO is dying or there's fewer people playing, it's a kit, this cascading effect that builds off of itself and it makes people want to play less and less and less. There's a huge bandwagon effect with MMO RPGs. There's, there's nothing more demotivating than like going into your major city, seeing no one. Going through these leveling zones, seeing no one. And the world feels dead. It makes you feel like you're wasting your time. Shoutouts to the level boost in Burning Crusade Classic, by the way. Due to the downward trend in subscriptions, skepticism, if it would be a success, was at an all-time high. This was still far into the future, though, and the current focus remained to be Cataclysm, which at this point was still steadily losing subscribers. In November, yep. along with the final raid, Dragon Soul, the LFR system would see its release. Similar to the Dungeon Finder, released in the Wrath of the Lich King expansion, this would allow players to matchmake with others another, another in difficulty a setting here. mode, doubling down on their design of trading away critical social and RPG functions for the sake of convenience and accessibility. Yep, to accommodate you lose something with accessibility. Organization Absolutely. That came with cube based matchmaking, and their the difficulty would be yeah. lowered even further than that it's... of the base normal difficulty. It was from this point forward. Again, I, I haven't played retail in a while, but when I played it, like LFR was pretty, I don't know, brainless. You, could, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't even have to read any raid strategies. You just kind of go in there and just whack the bosses. You could even stand in mechanics and kill all the bosses. So, I mean, you lose, you lose something with accessibility. You gain stuff for sure, right? But you also lose something that players no longer needed to and for this you lose guild to experience the end yeah you lose com they you lose need. community structures you lose social structures you lose a reason to gear up if you can just clear through the final rate of the game you know fairly effortlessly what well, where's the reason to you know invest more time into your character it's like oh i, I beat the game need to read strategies and they didn't even need to speak a single word, in fact. As I Blizzard will DJ be an sure. issue that 100% of the players are not completing show. these raids in their entirety. The accomplishment of clearing a raid would be more accessible than ever before, but as a result, the accomplishment would mean nothing from this point forward. Maybe there not is, maybe um, not nothing. Would be maybe it's a little bit much to say nothing there. But it would mean less. The WoW Killer was beginning to generate interest. Star Wars Galaxies at this point... Old Republic time, down. baby. In order to bolster the subscriber base of Star Wars The Old Republic, developed by Bioware and published by... Uh-oh. <laughs> uh Uh-oh. It would be attempt number two for Star Wars yeah. on the massively multiplayer scale. This installment promised a unique and fully voice-acted campaign for each of their classes, a space shooter component with a customizable ship, a thriving endgame for PvE and PvP, and perhaps most importantly, it was during the first time where the reigning champion showed weakness. 
Mm -hmm. While ultimately the previous the first the first uh, their own merits, it can be argued dent in that the armor and the success of the World of Warcraft during their debut certainly made them look worse in comparison. Now that this weakness was showing, though, the timing was ideal. Would the old republic succeed where its predecessors failed? Ex subscribers disillusioned with the direction that the game it's had so taken monotone. throughout the cataclysm looked at the old republic as the true success. The true this wild time. killer. Players this time for sure. And the imminent demise of World of Warcraft ever since its launch in 2004. Yeah. Only this time, the game's downward trend would support their claims. Yep. So the moment of truth this, came. This was the first quote WoW killer that was released when WoW was actually losing subs. So it was like, okay, this time it's for sure. It's Star Wars. It's a huge IP. This is before Disney ruined it, of course. Absolutely huge IP, bringing this this huge fan base. The launcher. Let's see what happens. And like many other MMOs before it, the Old Republic launched too early. In an attempt to release it during the Too holiday early. season, it pressured by EA, out, by the way, and would suffer from technical issues, game-breaking bugs, and questionable design decisions. Most notable of which is their use yeah, of the poopy hero engine. engine, which proved to be poor in an MMO environment. The there would be a short delay between here. a player casting a spell and that spell. Look how bad this landing. looks! Look how jank this looks! Look how terrible it looks! This does not. Tor did not feel good. An issue they attempted to, to rectify me. by tying an animation for each ability to make it seem more natural. As a result, though. So, like, look at this delay. It's almost a full second from when you press the button. Combat is more than a full second from when you press the button to where you see the damage. It just made the whole game feel laggy. Uh, one of the issues with Tor was that the foundation of which they build the game was bad. They tried to like put in these animations and stuff to sort of cover it up, but you know, this was a game. I kind of compare it. I feel like Final Fantasy fourteen I don't like I, I feel Final Final Fantasy fourteen doesn't feel fun to play. It doesn't feel responsive to me. Um, this was one of the major issues with Tor. Felt very sluggish and awkward, and those used to the crisp. Like, look how look how clean this looks. Combat system. Look at that. The huge and immediate downgrade. In look how quality. responsive. This, combined with other disappointing features. Wow, was such as and spaceship well, I'm sure it still is. Entirely on rails hindered its success in its crucial launch period. The game had sold over 2 million copies and held 1.7 million subscribers. Another great launch. Which was around a six Absolutely. of Warcraft subscriptions at the time. The closest that any recent MMO came to rivaling WoW's popularity oh God, since Ilum. its launch in 2004. But much like the Lord of the Rings Online, the Age of Conan, and Warhammer Online, the Star Wars The Old Republic suffered a similar yeah. fate and the subscriptions quickly plummeted. That's, it's every MMO these days, it seems. You have this huge, slow hype period. Follow my mouse cursor here. This huge, slow hype period. Then you have this like critical mass on release. It breaks new records, and it evens out. It settles on a niche subscriber base, because it, it just... it uh, All of the appeal is tied to the hype, the, the, the new car smell, the honeymoon period, and it, they're unable to retain this huge surge for whatever reason they can they can't retain it wow was like the only one that after this huge surge in the beginning it went up and uh, 14 you could say as well 14 has also broken that but every, every it seems like pretty much every every single look new world lost ark all of them they Not follow this eight months later it would convert to the free-to-play model often seen as the death sentence yeah. of mmos Today, the game holds a total of five servers, once again coming nowhere near being the WoW killer it was predicted to be. You were the chosen one, SW Tor. World of Warcraft. Not join them. <laughs> <laughs> the prequels are superior to the original trilogy in Star Wars. I'm just going to say that. Time March Casually drop that the knowledge bomb on you. expansion would release in the month of September, and for the first time since the release of the Wrath of the Lich King expansion, they saw an increase in subscriptions, though the eagerness of the player base was notably diminished, as this would be the first expansion to fail in breaking sales records oh, for miss Blizzard okay, upon I, release. I forgot that. I said earlier that uh, Dragonflight was the first one to break, to not break sales records. I guess, yeah, that's right, Missa Pandaria. Yeah, people weren't, I was one of them. I, wasn't, I looked at Miss and I thought, this looks stupid. 
I, I know a lot of you guys like mists, and that's fine. But I did not buy mists on release because I thought it looked stupid. The theme did not appeal to me, and I, I don't think it appear, appealed to a lot of the Western audience. Falling 30% below than that of Cataclysm. Barring this initial surge, they would be unable to halt the downward trend that had begun since the launch of Cataclysm, as subscribers would quickly yeah. drop from 10 million at launch to 9 million. It was just a slow and, and steady six point decline. at its lowest point, a drop of over 30%, and the players were starting to feel the effect of a world that grew less active with each passing day. Cross Realm officially saw its release, which would make the world seem sprawling once more. But once again, at the expense yeah. of the server's community, which would be present only in name from the... Look at my mouse cursor down there. Did you guys see it? Error in editing. You see the mouse cursor down here? The wow mouse cursor? Once again, at the expense of the server's community. Maybe I, I have this too blown up. Um, again, I'm pretty harsh on cross realm zoning here, but again, I'll, I think I say it in the video. Unnecessary evil. It's a, it's a, a band-aid fix for a bigger problem. The bigger problem, WoW is bleeding subs like crazy at this point. Bulbacat's official, thank you for the prime. Which would be present only in name from this point forward. Seeing the same players and guilds on your server consistently turned out to be an integral from, part this of This is a beta of 2019 classic. I realized once it was taken away. The world once more had players in it, but due to the large amount of servers that would be grouped together, players scarcely saw yeah. or recognized you lost that other community. players from mm -hmm. previous adventures. The basis to form a community, which had been a key reason for its success, hey, was Gio. now a hey. memory. The world was in a predicament, and Shout Blizzard to had Gio. a difficult problem to solve. A nearly empty world with little community, or a full world, ironically enough, with no community, exactly. though innocent enough on launch. Crossroom is Good point, that season. as a necessary evil for a problem, which true solution lies in recapturing subscribers now lost. An issue that Blizzard would struggle with for years to come, as the once iconic MMORPG now barely resembled an MMO due to its destroyed social structures, and barely an RPG due to its abandoned RPG elements. Yep. Which would be taken a step further. I, I feel like that it was Miss of Pandaria. Again, not even like the fault of Miss, but this is when it really lost a lot of the charm that made it big. I feel it was like Cataclysm Mists era. This is when a lot of the charm just kind of fell to the wayside. Further, in March of 2013, as the game saw another major change with its first instance of Forged Loot. Released with a oh God. Thunder Raid, Loot Forged had the potential Loot. to have an increased quality. Regardless of the difficulty at which the players defeated Thank the you, bosses, for the prime. having previously lost longevity in the raiding scene through the reduced base difficulty, they had hoped to regain it via randomized loot. And although it was relatively tame at the time of its release, this forging system would later be seen by many to get out of hand and yeah. help diminish and by confuse the reward structure that had been standard for the game. It got out of hand with Titan Forging. This I love Legion, but Titan Forging was way out of. I think you could like proc up to fifty eye levels with Titan Forging in Legion at some point, and uh, you could get like gear better than heroic rating, maybe even mythic rating through world quests. Um, so it kind of like removed a lot of the reason to raid. And uh, since you could spam Mythic Pluses infinitely, like Mythic Plus really started to take over as the end game activity, which I, I think, you know, Mythic Pluses are great, but I think raiding, you know, with how much time and effort is put into raiding in these raid bosses, it's kind of, um, it's kind of a wasted opportunity or a waste of effort to keep raiding as like the mainstay end game activity. And uh, this was made even worse with BFA when they, re they removed tier sets. So what reason is there to raid if you can forge an infinitely spammable activity whereas raids are a weekly lockout? Like the whole the whole end game, the whole gearing system, which in my opinion has always been one of the game's strengths, it was just like flipped on its head, especially with BFA. I think starting in Legion though. For eight years at that point. Very RNG, very I slot machine like. Uh MMOs are always RNG. And to some capacity, to some degree, but I feel like Legion was, you know, they went like hardcore 
There, there can be a point to where there's too much randomness. To where you feel less like you're being rewarded for your, your time investment and more rewarded for just getting lucky. Just getting lucky, hitting the right RNG, like slots. And that's bad in a, in a, a genre of game based around time investment and character development. If you feel like you're more rewarded by a slot machine and RNG than you are your, your time investment, that leaves a, a pretty poor taste in the player base's mouth. I think. I think that's the issue. Past patches released, new raids and systems debuted, and much changed with the expansion in the year of 2013. Yeah, Something the Arcano Crystal, you guys remember that? Ongoing Legion. downward trend of subscribers. In BlizzCon 2013, Blizzard would announce its next expansion, the Warlords of Draenor. The player base would journey back to the world of Draenor, an alternate reality. There was, was so much hype into what around this. As the Outland in the Burning Crusade expansion. It's here where they would establish forward bases, known as garrisons, and launch a campaign against Garrosh Hellscream, the leader of the United Orc Army, known as the Iron Horde, who are set to invade the land of Azeroth. At this point, the private server community had gained considerable traction as players yearned for the game that had originally captivated them. Um, there was so much hype around the Warlords of Draenor. I think partly because you're going to Draenor, aka the Outland, before it was corrupted, so a lot of people kind of saw it as return to BC in a, in a large way. Um, but once we get to Draenor, I'll, we'll note again, Blizzard has no problem selling expansions. Draenor sold like crazy. Dude, Henry, thank you for the... Uh, the $20 super chat there. He says, my classic WoW videos got me through the freshman year of college. Thanks for giving us a taste of how good, how good WoW was in the glory days. Dude, Henry, thank you for watching my videos, man. Thank you for the support. I, uh, I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's, it's my pleasure. I love making videos, so thank you for watching them. And we're becoming more and more unruly as the retail version strayed further and further away yeah. from its mm -hmm. roots and they began campaigning Blizzard to officially develop and support this past version of I feel, the game. I feel like it's a little bit pretentious to like agree with myself as I'm talking. <laughs> but this was when private this is when private servers were really really going. At this point, they're really becoming populated as uh as the game changed and got further and further away from vanilla wow there's more of a demand for private servers and this this is a big moment right here in a q a panel during the convention one such player asked for an official answer there's on ghost the crawler ability of a legacy server the question was fielded by j allen brack uh -oh. at the time a production director for world of warcraft and he delivered this now infamous answer have you ever thought about adding servers for previous expansions as they were then no. And, uh -oh. and by the way, you don't want to that to do that either. You think you do, but you don't. Remember when Oof. you had to like spam cities and say need a tank, need a tank, need a tank during the Burning Crusade days? You don't remember that because now you just push a button that says go to the dungeon. You this, don't want to do that. Yeah, this but is the quote would draw immediate ire. The shot the heard around the world. It would prove to be an integral moment in its development, <laughs> serving as a rally. You remember the, the start of the Revolutionary War at Lexington and Concord? This was the shot heard around the world. This was like the rallying cry of the vanilla community. And cry of sorts, and bringing more and more attention on the possibilities of developing such a version of the game. The answer was seen as dismissive and it was out very of touch, dismissive, especially and considering out of touch. the fact that private servers, and especially considering how many people um, played Classic on launch. You guys remember 2019 re-release of Classic? They uh, they tripled the subscription revenue of World of Warcraft on the release of 2019 Classic. It was incredibly out of touch. What he said there. There's a huge demand for vanilla. You guys remember the wall of no on the forums? People were like so... There are people out there who were like so invested into Classic not being released. They would, they would like spend all of their time on the forums trying to like explain to people why Classic, why they didn't, why Classic was all nostalgia and they didn't actually like it. Yeah, it got really toxic. It got super toxic.
Cars at this point had grown to new levels of popularity. I think that's Nostalgia's launch, what I showed there. Answer, the questions started turning into demands. There it is. Wall of no. Yep, this is it. People would make this, this like, this, this five page thesis statement on why classic, nobody wants classic and how it'll never be released. Discussion of its viability or not and serve to fan the flames of a community becoming increasingly disillusioned of the world of Warcraft and Blizzard yeah, people were in like, their current state. They were so invested into it. Like their entire lives revolved around classic, oh god. I think I feel my eyeball twitching. Leaving, Blizzard had sought to recover financially. Boost? Somebody say boost? An increased focus and impact of their cash shop. And against all assurances previously made shortly after their merger yep. with Activision, they would finally turn the corner in December of 2013 and officially implemented the cash shop in game. And along with it came the most impactful service to dun, date, dun, dun. The level boost. Mm. Leveling was now skippable as yeah. players could pay $60. This to is this is where the slippery slope falls off the, the edge of a cliff, by the way. Started in, again, started in Activision merger. 2008 all all the people who said that these pets won't 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 uh lead to being able to buy all forms of character progression immediately the slippery slope fallacy is rarely a fallacy usually people bring it up because they don't like what they're hearing trust me i got a lot of experience with that shout outs to the level boost and wow token in 2019 2021 classic no 2019 to the main line of classic be fast tracked to the maximum level and jump right into the end game. Told you so, by, by the large, way. The most impactful paid service at that point, what was at one point seen as a cornerstone of MMO design, was now skippable through an officially endorsed service. The consequence and yeah. investment of picking a class. MMOs are defined by leveling. Leveling it and to skip leveling is like thrown away sacrificed like many other features for convenience. For me it's like it's having a racing game and skipping an entire circuit of tracks. Like you're 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 skipping and accessibility and a huge portion of the financial game. gain, further damaging its already crippled RPG design. The backlash was immediate, but little did players know it was just the beginning. Yeah. And the standards of paid advantage in the game would sink lower and lower yep. in the coming years. It, it turned from it turned from its only pets to its only race changes to its only faction changes to its only level boost to its only WoW token. And uh, through the WoW token, you could you pay for anything. You could pay for levels. You could pay for arena ranking. You could get the best gear in the game through mythic carries by using the wow token and two things right? and uh wrath classic as well now has the wow token too and that combined with the gdkp culture that's taken over that game it's it's sort of like the most efficient way to play the game now is not to invest your time it's to invest your money and that uh that results in the players just not being invested into their characters i mean how, how could you because it's not it's not time investment it's the money investment in subscriber count and stagnation the final major patch of the expansion had released in this is yeah another big drop here too this year 2013 and other than the addition of the level boost the game saw no updates until the warlords of draenor pre-patch in october of 2014 an astounding gap of 13 months in the game's development this had marked the longest and i will also say again if being if skipping all this content, skipping leveling, buying WoW tokens, if this is all so great for the game, why is Wrath Classic completely dead now? Where you can buy all levels and you can buy WoW tokens. It's drought yet. Why is everybody playing Season of Discovery, a version of the game where currently, as of right now, <laughs> knock on wood, you can't buy levels or WoW tokens? Subscribers fled the game in record numbers as the mists of Pandaria failed to retain the migrating player base. And I, I'll say this as well. You could say because Wrath is stagnating. I'll you mark my words. Cataclysm Classic. I think we'll have a pretty big launch, but it's going to stagnate quick. Cataclysm is yeah. Cataclysm isn't going to do well. You'll have a fairly active launch, but it'll die off quick because because there's no investment. There's no rewarding nature to paying for everything and if you have the ability to pay for everything 
Like who who is going to level in vanilla World of Warcraft when there's a button on the login screen where you can pay fifty dollars to have an instantly max level character? You feel stupid for playing the game. If you if you have, why would you farm for gold for X amount of hours when you could just get it inst anything you want instantly with the click of a button? It makes you feel stupid for actually playing the game, and it turns out that's not good for the population of the game. I know that's crazy to think, but. That's the big pro that's one of the November big problems the level boost and WoW tokens the launch of the warlords people of people expansion. people won't ever understand that they won't ever relinquish that the game that all the the games with all this character progression that you could buy could have four people playing and they'll still say that it's it's somehow amazingly good for the game it doesn't matter the troubles, they've already a decided marketing what they think and hype led to a rather successful expansion launch sales wise yeah wad was crazy three million players had expansions in hand ready to step through the dark portal for a second time and subscriptions skyrocketed to 10.5 million the highest it had been since the launch of the mists of pandaria and it holds the record of the largest surge in subscribers for expansion launches yeah. Well, unfortunately for Blizzard, history would repeat itself in more ways than one, as once again they had failed to retain this boon as problems soon was... arose after launch. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Every fucking server that I even play on is offline. <laughs> oh, yeah. It looks like mine aren't the only ones. Uh, yeah. Uh, they had come under a DDoS attack. This wasn't all Blizzard's fault. This was flooded with artificial DDoS by uh, they shut down the Lizard the Squad or something. This would go on for several days as law enforcement investigated into the matter. Meanwhile, though, players would become increasingly frustrated as the game remained to be mostly unplayable. The culprits were eventually stopped, but the damage had been done, and the game experienced its worst launch since its initial. Oops. Ah, shit. Uh, I'm sorry. Hang on, let me get back there. I accidentally hit a button on my mouse and it, it's... Okay, here we go. We're back. Um, again, I, I don't think launches are absolutely critical. They're important. And the reason why WAD, as you'll see, had huge issues was just the game. There's so much cut from WAD, but yeah, certainly the launch didn't help. 2004. What's more, once worst launch since okay, its initial release Sorry about that. in 2004. What's more, once the issue subsided, players were met with what is now widely considered to be one of the worst expansions in the game's history. The main feature of the expansion, the garrison system, isolated players in their own instance, where they yeah. could recruit followers, start an herb garden, mine and craft, and even convenient. use the house with the correct buildings. But is convenience Although convenient, good? It served as yet another feature to alienate an already fractured community from Again, each other. Accessibility, convenience, you no longer have to be a miner to get mining veins, you no longer have to be an herbalism to get herbalist, herbal herbal herbals i don't know herbs there you go uh you can craft anything with any professions as long as you have the building you can use the auction house in your garrison but another example of convenience and accessibility um destroying a lot one of the main ones being the social structures everybody in their own instance made the world seem dead in the game at which again the the optics of a dead world is terrible and as if it was single player a problem made worse by the massive hemorrhage of subscribers that was yet to come. Just as how the expansion broke subscription Rock records thank you, man. at launch, it also broke records for lost subscriptions shortly after, as players saw little enjoyment from what was eventually ousted as an unfinished expansion. Yeah, the WAD got many destroyed. Of the features on... previously teased would be left on the cutting room floor. Yep, including new systems, two major cities, battlegrounds another zone, and even an entire raid tier. Shatrath raid. Few. Time between patches would grow even larger. There's a lot of stagnation too. I feel like if they are ever to do WAD Classic, which who knows if they will, it could be a chance to redeem it. One of the big reasons why, I mean, there are many reasons why WAD didn't do too well, but one of the big ones just due, due to all the cut content. If they could uh, maybe finish that Shatrath raid, and movable garrisons and these zones that didn't get released um wad classic could be a chance to see how to see the release of wad how it was supposed to be before you know they cut everything i don't know if that'll happen but i'm just saying it could be a good opportunity and the patches themselves delivered less content 
The expansion held a total of just three major raids throughout its entirety, with every expansion proceeding yeah. having at least four. The combined effect of instanced garrisons and players flocking away made the new world seem dead, and so more and more servers would be connected to each other in an attempt yeah. to bring There's life a lot back into of the connections. World, as subscriptions plummeted to an all time low since its initial rise in vanilla. 5.5 5 is still a lot million. though. It was announced shortly after Just to say. that they would no longer report subscription numbers, stating that there are better indicators yeah. of business performance. The message was clear. Cha -ching. Where they had lost revenue in subscriptions, they gained several times over via the paid level boost. Yeah. Success mm -hmm. was no longer tied to a healthy plan. If the path to the giant pile of money becomes predatory microtransactions as opposed to great game design, you get less great game design and more predatory microtransactions. Beyond anything anybody says about level boost, WoW tokens, whatever, they're good for the game, bad for the game. If they are the path to the giant pile of, pile of money, where's the incentive to, to create a good game over a predatory game that doesn't encourage you to play, but rather is good at encouraging you to buy microtransactions? You get less good game design because it's no longer the path to the giant pile of money. Player base, but rather revenue, and although looked at today as an embarrassing period in the game's history, financially it lifted the developer to new heights. This, this is combined with other cash shop services. And this is Borlords of Draenor. Widely today is looked to be a, a huge dud. It was one of their most. It was a record-breaking revenue. The level boost and the Warlords of Draenor played a large role in Activision Blizzard's best financial quarter to date. The influence of the cash shop now fully realized. It would be taken a step further in March of 2015. There it is. With the addition of the WoW token, where players could exchange that real money slope. for in-game gold, or on the other hand, use gold to purchase a token to pay for the subscription fee, or convert it into a balance only spendable on Blizzard products. Regardless of the method, it would prove to be a massive commercial success yeah. for Activision Blizzard. Quarter two, 2015 record profits earnings during record low subscriptions. Yep. Just look at this headline here. Earning them record profits. Last 1.5 million subscribers. Revenues are up. During record low subscriptions. It's, it speaks for itself. No time and past. No comment needed. The cash shop's initial rise in 2008. Those who warned of the dangerous path that World of Warcraft was set on saw their predictions unfold slowly over the course of several years. At this point in the game's history, it was possible to buy levels, it was possible mm -hmm. to buy currency, Good point, Mad and season. with this currency, you could buy items and even services from other you could buy anything, such as raid or arena carries, and the list of things that you couldn't buy was now far shorter than the list of things that you could buy. It was at this point that the game was deemed by many to be pay to win yeah. as real life purchases now had a clear and heavy impact. Um, people get on me for this quote because they say that, well, you can't really win an MMO. There's no credit screen. Well, let's just go over the ways that you can play an MMO. You can be a raider with the WoW token. You can buy the best gear in the game. You could be a PvPer with the WoW token. You can buy arena carries, getting the best PvP gear in the game. Uh, through the if you just if you're a transmog, cosmetic type of person, you can buy a plethora of, of cosmetics within the cash shop. And with the WoW token, you can buy gold to buy even more cosmetics. Like what ways what what ways of playing the game aren't purchasable with real life money in World of Warcraft at this point? You can buy anything, so I think yeah, it is. Say I think it's fair to say it's pay to win. You can you can buy every activity with the WoW token. On the power levels between different whatever players. whatever winning may be to you, you can do anything with it. Behavior that previously warranted suspensions was now officially endorsed and advertised, and any semblance of integrity the game had left was abandoned. Though at this point, subscriptions were no longer being reported. Morale of the game's future continued to decline. Yeah. But there's a light at, at the end of the tunnel here. Legion in August of the same year came at a very critical mentioned. time. The next expansion, Legion, would be announced. The long lost Broken Isles were discovered, and the orc warlock, Gul'dan, unleashed a second burning crusade upon Azeroth. Things get a little bit depressing in this video, I know, but Legion's release was critical because, yeah, morale of 
morale of the game had dra- I played it, Drainer was very low. People, there were people out there who thought Drainer was like the last expansion, but here comes Legion, and as you'll see here, Legion was was a critical release here. The Legion wasn't perfect, but they did pretty damn well with Legion. I uh, thank you, Lusharn. Says keep up the great work, dude, Lusharn. Thank you for the support there, man. It would feature a new class, the Demon Hunter, among many supporting systems. Legion, is- Legion releasing is the equivalent of the Veil saving um, Jon Snow versus uh, Ramsay Bolton in Game of Thrones. That's what Legion was. Powerful and unique artifact weapons that players could obtain and level up as an additional form of character progression. Each class would have a story-driven Order Hall campaign quest line. A new Legion, was, Legion was hype. Would be added, where from Legendaries were in the game had flaws, had a small chance but to obtain powerful legendary items it had flaws, to further enhance their characters. That's my friend, by the way. To obtain Nobody wanted this piece of crap. This is one of the issues with Legendaries. Um, they're really good ones. They're really poopoo ones. They're completely RNG, and they could take like months to get sometimes uh, in the early stages of the game before they increase the drop rate. If you got Suffuse or Pride as the amulet, people laughed at you. Legendary. This is actually me looting this. And look at my friend Stufers here, my friend since Vanilla World of Warcraft. The items to further enhance their characters. <laughs> he laughs yep. at me. Because this was the original Suffuse, as you could see. It's uh, so if you like uh, CC somebody, like Root or Slow, you get movement speed and haste. They later buffed this to, I think, like 25% haste or 30%. They buffed it, but it was poo-poo at this point. This was the issue with Legion Legendaries. Daily quest hubs would be replaced with world quests, offering a greater variety in daily activities, which had become standard for several years, and the Mythic Plus system, an infinitely scaling timed challenge mode to bring dungeons back Mythic once Pluses more were awesome. as the focus of endgame content. After the Warlords of Draenor, the confidence of the players was at an all-time low, and many would hope that Legion would be the expansion to redeem it. Although mm-hmm. subscription numbers were no longer being reported, it had tied the release day sales records set by Cataclysm several years prior, selling a total of 3.3 million copies it sold well. on release. Quarterly investor reports would also provide promising data on the overall reception of the Legion expansion, suggesting higher playtime per player. And I, I will also say here... Um... The, the token was out at this point as well. So, and I like Legion. Um, generally, I'm anti-microtransaction, but I am capable, if I feel like the game is good enough, I am capable of looking past that. I've said this for a while. Level boost and WoW tokens were in the game at this point. But, um, you know, as you'll see with BFA Shadowlands, I wouldn't necessarily compare it to the quality of Legion. But no, I liked Legion. I, I had a lot of fun in Legion. I, I personally was able to look past it. Mostly due to the success of its major features, the expansion as a whole proved to be William, a much thank needed you recovery. For the, prime. the Order Halls, being public locations that players shared, served as a base of operations and, unlike the previous garrison system, you shared didn't them. harm its own social aspect. Yeah. World quests, compared to the old daily You weren't alone in them. You shared them with your class. In players' daily activities, and Mythic Plus saw high activity as players enjoyed the timed Mythic Pluses and were high. challenge that they provided. Most of its features were received well, and with a solid rating scene to support it, it's generally looked back I at love favorably Nighthold. by even the most embittered fans, with its criticisms primarily being drawn from its reward structure. Yeah. The legendaries, we talked about this. drop chance, and high impact on gameplay would be a source of frustration, so much so that they would receive a rehaul late into the expansion where players could purchase specific pieces with a new currency. You got that from World Quest, typically. The forging system also contributed to this atmosphere of luck by holding too much power in character progression. At this point, it was called Titan Forging, which had a much larger eye level range compared to the more tame Thunder Forging first introduced in Pandaria. Think, oh, Items here. could roll up to 60 eye levels. Yep, 60 eye levels. I think Thunder Forging was like 10 eye levels max. Titan Forging, it could proc off of itself. So if it rolled 810, it would do another roll. If it succeeded, 815. If it rolled 815, it would do another roll, 820, all the way up to 
60 initially. This was later nerfed, I think, or changed higher than that of their base, which made it possible to obtain mythic rating quality gear from even the most mundane activities. Yeah. World of Warcraft and MMOs in general. I, I feel like that was a bad. amount of luck tied to progression, but this added layer of needing the right piece to drop and for that piece to titan forge socket to reward structure further from i didn't i didn't mention um the socket as well you also wanted a socket time investment to blind luck yeah. and combined with the legendary system many players would liken the expansion to a slot machine though overall legion would be received quite that that was the main one complaint with legion it was very rng based i love legion overall it was very rng based but overall, it, it was a, I think it was a great expansion. Well, it was met with troubling news from within. Senior Vice President of Story yep. and Franchise Development, Chris Metz, this was huge. who had been with the company for 23 years at that point, there he had is. announced his retirement, citing burnout, panic attacks, and the desire to spend more time with his family as the primary reasons for the decision. Casual. What a casual. <laughs> Having been one of the most public actually said figures it. and a primary I don't remember that. for the world of Warcraft and the characters who inhabited it, it was seen as a tremendous loss, with fans yeah, and co-workers he... alike commenting on his influence on the franchise. Yeah, there's, I mean, Chris Metzen was like synonymous with World of Warcraft. I feel like it's, Blizzard was, um, this eventually came back at them, as you'll see in the video, but there's this kind of like Hollywood this Hollywood culture, like you, you knew Blizzard developers by name and you knew their job roles and you knew what they did. Like how many of you guys know who's, who does boss designs and from software, who does the story design in, uh, in Sekiro, for instance. Um, again, this is, this is part of the Blizzard culture and like the BlizzCons and the community feeling and how open they are with the players and stuff. Uh, one of the, one of the reasons they became so big. But yeah, Metzen leaving was huge, huge news. He's he's back today, of course. He came back with Dragonflight. But yeah, at the time, this was this was absolutely huge. Along with this newfound growth of Legion, the private server community had also been thriving. And in 2016, it was larger than it had ever been at that yeah, point. Yeah, Nostalgia's time. Getting to a server named Nostalgia's. Good lord. So many goddamn people. You think you do, but it's you don't. Literally, the server's been up for about 10 minutes, and people are just entering, and this is the scene. The server had been hosting over 130,000 active players worldwide. An impressive feat for a game that users had to seek out yeah. on their own. Keep in mind, Vanilla WoW, not officially advertised. People had to find these vanilla servers. They had to, to yearn for vanilla so much, they had to find these random-ass servers usually hosted like i believe in europe because they have more lax copyright laws i think if you host them in the u.s you stand more risk of being sued so just keep that in mind whenever you see all of these players these are people who sought out they weren't advertised this necessarily they sought out this version of the game i, I think that's something to mention dude fabian my god man the 50 euro super chat there he says, love your content. Fabian, thank you so much there for the support. That's insane. Hell yeah, man. Thank you for watching my content. I, uh, I really, really appreciate that. I hope you're enjoying this react today. I'm going to be uploading this to my Bad Season Show channel if you guys are just coming in. We're going on uh, hour three here. We've completed one hour. We're on pace for a six-hour react for a two-hour video. Let's, let's pause less, maybe. To be their downfall, however. As Philo, April thank you, man. For the Blizzard had sent cease and desist letters for those responsible yep. for running the server, threatening legal action if they refused to shut it down. I personally this is Nano. Investigator hired to Shoutouts to Nano. By a legal firm that represents Blizzard. He called numerous people in my life, including my employer, my owner of my company, to confirm information about me, they went after him. Served me papers at 10 p.m. on a Wednesday night, slamming and knocking on the door, freaking the crap out of my wife, yeah, and waking up my baby daughter in the next room. They would come. J. Allen Brack kicked in his fucking door. He says, "I'll show you that you really think that you you, you do, but you don't." <laughs> but again, it's you know it's easy uh, to look at Blizzard as the bad guy here, but you know again they're legally. They're legally bound to protecting their IP. If they don't, if they don't protect it, they can get sued by shareholders. 
So I just, you know, I want, again, I don't, I don't uh, throw myself in front of traffic for Blizzard, but you, you got to be fair there and you, you have to make note of that. You can't re necessarily paint them as like a, the bad guy here. They're legally required to do that or they can get sued. It's important to know. Comply shortly after as tens of thousands of players logged in one last time to save yeah, the Yeah, this is the, the ending that they had built. The shutdown, although completely within Blizzard's rights legally, mm -hmm. naturally sparked outrage among the private server community. Look at a the amount of people. Was created for an officially developed Blizzard legacy server, and it would reach nearly 300,000 signatures Grims in the span of two weeks. And although it didn't provide immediate results, much like the infamous you think you do but you don't quote, it would prove to be a critical moment in Classic's history. I was thinking um, a video I could do, I had a thought of this, a history of classic WoW specifically. So going over vanilla WoW into the, maybe the private server history into 2019 release into, you know, BC classic, Wrath classic, SOD. Um, let me know if you guys would like to see that. That could be a, an upcoming video. Look at the amount of people there though. Isn't that insane? Oh God! Oh, uh, the next need, expansion would be revealed. I need a at beer. Twenty seventeen, and players learned of the battle for Azeroth. I need a drink. Having thwarted the second Burning Crusade, the Horde and Alliance now turned their attention on each other and would stage an all-out war over oh, a new Azerite. resource oh, called Azerite. No. This resource would serve as oh, a way please. to empower a new amulet, the level of which would unlock traits in accompanying armor pieces. The system had been set up similarly to the previously successful artifact system and advertised increased customization mm -hmm. and player agency, allowing them to tailor their characters to suit their gameplay style. You might find a power yeah, I'll let him speak. twice about using a talent that you'd previously written off, and you will certainly find combinations that reinforce your favorite way to play your character. One That's how it was designed. Of obtaining this resource That's not how it turned out. Expeditions where a team of three players could fight against another team of players or AI for Azerite found randomly throughout the island with random enemy selection, placement, and quests serving as the primary means of attempting to add replayability and longevity to them. It's something that we're calling dynamic yeah. replayability. Every time you come to this space, here, I have, I have some comments the on this. Are in different locations. There are additional gameplay elements scattered throughout the world, and it's always a little bit different. Or for Any feature that's tied to a daily or weekly timer will eventually become boring. I don't care how it's designed. I don't care what it is. It's, it's, you're, you're trying to code against human nature. People get bored of doing even like raiding people get bored of you know you do molten core 20 times you're pretty much done with molten core um yeah this the, i feel like this is one of bfa's big faults here is there's so many daily lockouts so many weekly lockouts uh, and the same with shadowlands like tower of torgas i don't care how well it's designed if it's tied to a daily or weekly time timer and that's how you gear your character or progress your character it will eventually become boring Fronts were a new feature, which were reminiscent of... People don't like being compelled to do something under the threat of losing progression if they don't do it. It makes it feel like they're not in charge of their game time. If they feel like they're not in charge of their game time, it's, 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 the, it's the whole point of the video game. The whole reason they're playing a video game is to have fun. To, to go away from 9 to 5 chores... All this real life responsibility to just play a video game, relax, and have fun. I can't tell you how many times I was in Discord with my friends during BFA, and like one of them would hop in and say, Hey, anybody want to do chores with me? When the players are referencing your game in any capacity as a chore, that's a problem. And that ended up being, you know, we'll see, but that ended up being one of the big issues with BFA here. Too many chores the original strategy games that the MMO was based off of. In here, you would battle for resources and construct and upgrade buildings and um, fend off troops with the ultimate goal of defeating the enemy commander. One of the reasons why I, th I think is a, um, why people like Vanilla World of Warcraft is, you know, just think of the daily weekly timers in WoW. You have raiding for your weekly timers and 
you have like some profession cooldowns if you have transmutes. You feel like you're much more in charge of your game time in vanilla WoW because there's there's such a lack of okay, you have to do this every week or every day to progress your character. You feel like you're more in control. And that's why I I always say like people have this idea that vanilla World of Warcraft is really like hardcore and stuff. I disagree. I think vanilla World of Warcraft is far more casual friendly than retail has been in a long time due to this this daily and weekly uh, timers that they have. These wouldn't be the only announcements the World of Warcraft team had, though. And I want to talk about... Uh-oh. Ice cream. Oh, shit. <laughs> ice cream is great. Vanilla. Ice cream is one of my favorite desserts. Personally, I love chocolate, and I love cookies and cream. I was freaking out when I was cookies watching this, because I was... Is actually my all -time Classic was not expected. Dessert. I feel like nobody expected this. This but was the most hype. Some of you, oh my god. Your favorite, favorite flavor, flavor is vanilla. vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> freak. I feel like nobody, I certainly did not expect, when I was watching this live, oh my, I'm glad I didn't record it because the noises I was making, yeah, it was embarrassing to say the least. Years they had claimed a re-release of previous versions of the game was impossible. World of Warcraft Classic would be unveiled, combining the updated Legion. I know I don't sound too excited in the video, right? It doesn't really come off that well, but yeah, I, I was all in. Client with old data discovered on a backup of a backup held on to by an ex-employee. A small team dedicated their efforts in providing a home for the ever-growing population of vanilla fans in place of the one that they had not so long ago taken away. Yep. Details of development would follow shortly after, with the philosophy of changing as little of the game as possible in an effort to most accurately recreate the experience as it was from 2004 to 2007. No changes. Including a phasing schedule to match roughly the original release. Something I hope that they're going to do for Sod, by the way. This would be my, my personal preference. I feel like it... I feel like it gives players more stuff to look forward to. I feel like this was an, an error an issue with hardcore mode they released all of this stuff at at launch and i feel like that hurts the longevity of the game because it's it's like you're blowing your entire load at the same time schedule and as requested by the player base the absence of many features such as the dungeon finder looking for raid mode and the end game cash shop to name just a few Combined with Legion's recent success, the outlook of the game was looking more promising yeah. than ever before. Yeah. The Battle for Azeroth soon saw its release in August of 2018. People were hyped. 3.4 million copies on its first New day, record. Breaking the record initially set by Cataclysm. And so keep in mind, Legion is the newest expansion and Classic is being released. So the, the outlook at this game went from like one of the worst with the ending of Draenor to like the sky's the limit. 2010. However, when the honeymoon phase ended, it's, the faults of it's the kind expansion of a, started to become clear. It's kind of like a roller coaster. You get like whiplash, right? The game is the best ever. The game is the worst ever. The game is the best ever. The game is the worst ever. I remember this time, especially uh, making videos during this time on the channel. With uh, like, I would say something positive about the game, and then the uh, there'd be a bunch of people who would call me like a fanboy or a shill. And if I were to say anything negative of the game, there'd be people who would who would say that I'm, you know, this hater farming rage bait content. Um, the community was had been become very polarized due to the highs and lows with the game. Um, a community that's still very polarized today, by the way. The Azerite armor system, which was said to hold major traits that altered how classes played, instead were a series of incidental procs that rarely did anything yeah. other than increase damage done, healing throughput, and damage mitigation, with some being just base stat increases. Oh, gameplay altering. That makes Versatility by 99. Talent that you'd previously written off, and you will certainly find combinations that reinforce hey, your Jammer, how's it going? to play your character. Not at all as gameplay altering as advertised. Yeah. And despite BFA being centered around a faction war, Warfronts were I, exclusively a PvE game mode, 
that were also nearly impossible you to couldn't lose, lose them with the only recorded losses resulting from the you couldn't lose them waiting within the base until they were overwhelmed wow i'm screenshotting this due to this <laughs> extreme lack of challenge they were seen to be more of a chore yeah. than anything else what what's the point of a video game you have to ask yourself what is the point of a video game you're given obstacles to overcome and along with these obstacles you're given satisfying ways to solve them video games fundamentally are just a, a series of problems for you to solve they're not necessary for a survival they're completely optional the whole point is to give you problems and satisfying ways to solve them and when there's no challenge it's not even a game at that point it's just something solely to take x amount of time to give you y reward it doesn't feel like a game that was a problem with warfronts if you can't lose them why do they exist and again right. it, it was it was just a reason to get you in them uh once a week or whenever your your faction you know donated the resources and you could do them it, it didn't feel like a game it was just it was just a, a an excuse to get you to to pump engagement metrics essentially Island expeditions, players solid. Again, the, the issue of uh, seeing the forest through the trees there from a game development standpoint, it's not even a game. It's not even a game mode. More of a chore than anything else. And as for island expeditions, players saw little replayability in the randomized selection of enemies, and behind the bells and whistles was a simple and repetitive truth. Rush to get the required amount of Azerite before the enemy that's, team does. And as a that's result, what it became. the game mode would become very repetitive very quickly. That's what it became, because again, any any feature that's tied in like a weekly, daily timer, that's what you can implement any in any amount of variance as you want. Ultimately the objective is the same and it'll become very repetitive. That's what I feel. I feel like that's a big trap that they fell into for BFA. The story would also come under heavy criticism. The oh, whole God. expansion would have a heavy focus on Sylvanas Windrunner, yeah. the leader of the Forsaken of the Horde, and throughout BFA's two-year run, she would face... Didn't Nobel quit during BFA? Or was that Shadowlands? What, uh, what expansion made Nobel, who comes across to me as one of the most patient, nicest guys on the planet, by the way, was it BFA that made Nobel say, all right, I'm not doing this. I'm, I need a, yeah, I need a break from this. Or is that Shadowlands? It's many major lore characters and even entire armies outwitting them at every turn or dispatching them with ease in combat. The decision she made often was it Shadowlands? no reasonable okay. explanation or logic, leaving the player base in the dark for the entirety of the expansion, and many would liken her to she was, Mary yeah, Sue, she was, a fiction archetype who yeah. is inexplicably free of any and all weakness. Such traits are also common oh, God. through self-inserts, which there was also evidence oh, no. of, as a writer for Blizzard would roleplay as a major character, Nathanos Blightcaller, on Twitter. The narrative structure remained yeah. ambiguous throughout the entirety of the expansion, with most criticism being made towards the ending. As was custom with the final boss of an yeah. expansion since the Wrath of the Lich King, players were treated with the finale cutscene. They would typically run a few minutes and were fully voice acted to animation presentations. I, I still get chills watching this. At long last, it's so good, man. No king rules forever, my son. Though for the battle for Azeroth, the old god Nazoth would be the. Yeah, finale. this was this was a um uh um a staple. Every every final boss, you get this big cinematic. You had uh, Arthas with Wrath. You had um, Deathwing with Cataclysm, and you had Garrosh with with uh, Missa Pandaria. And uh, you know, from that point yeah, forward, here. So let's let's see what BFA has in store for us. The patient building up as his existence was referenced several times up to the final patch of the expansion. And where players expected a similar voice acted dialogue between the major lore characters and their thoughts on defeating a god, they were instead met with the same footage I just droned over in a monotone manner. <laughs> yep, that was it. The feedback was immediate <laughs> and clear. That was, and that was literally it. The video would be unlisted yeah. as Blizzard tried to hide the blundered finish to a blunder of an expansion.
The initial wave of excitement quickly soured as all three major systems of the expansion oh. fell short of their goals. They would later be it hurts my heart. major patches, though players would have to wait nearly a yeah. year following their initial release. In response, monthly active users it's kind of a, would start taking... It's kind of a trend with Blizzard. Even like Legion, like I said, had issues with its release with the legendary systems is that what the expansion should have been players have to wait until 2.5 I think you can say that even with previous expansions a dive and in an attempt to bolster engagement metrics the expansion would aim to rely on what many described to be an excessive amount of activities designed Ooh, 100 depression for that quest diners. look at that nice. by the end of the expansion's lifespan this would be the full yeah. list many would I get come. I get um here I get some flack over this list. People's first response to this is that, well, you don't need to do all of this mad season show. This is just what it was at the end. How does a new player know that? How can a new player differentiate? Okay, do I need to do world? Do I need to do these emissaries? Mechagon quests, Nashitar quests? Okay, well, those are needed for flying. Assault quests? What are assaults? A minor assault, a major assault. When you're hit with like 40 different daily and weekly timers, you know what a player just reaching max level will do? They're not going to go to Wowhead. They're not going to go to YouTube to figure out what the hell they're supposed to be doing. They're just going to quit. And he would comment that the entire game they're gonna at quit. this point had devolved into a list of chores that she had a limited amount of time to complete, aimed to keep players in a gerbil-like routine, it was. going down a checklist for their daily session. Instead of feeling rewarded for their playtime and dedication, yeah. many would feel punished for missing mm -hmm. sessions and question their reasons for playing to begin with. It didn't feel like a game. You can make people play games in two different ways. You can, you can reward them for playing and make sure they have a fun time, or you can punish them for not playing and sort of hold them hostage. That's what I feel like BFA did. They punished players for not playing. And just two months after release, Blizzard would suffer another a devastating departure. A turtle made departure. it to the water. His co-founder, Mike Morham, yeah. announced that he was stepping down as company president. That was also promoting huge. Promoting then-executive producer, J. Allen Brack. They shared a really awkward place. hug. More troubling still, these people weren't quitting game development. They were quitting Blizzard. Yeah. Later, in 2020, Morham would announce a new company, Dreamhaven, and under its umbrella were two studios. Moonshot Games and Secret Door. I believe they have not done anything yet. I have no idea what they're working on, but Dreamhaven, I believe they're still developing something. Um, but yeah, that is something important to note. note. When Chris Metzen quit, he didn't stop the world of game development. He, uh, he did his tabletop company. Um, Morheim didn't stop, didn't, didn't uh, have the, the fire uh, go out of him with making games. He started a new studio of which many former members of Blizzard would be employed. In its announcement, they would stress that the goal of the company yeah, would be is tall. to prioritize He's a really tall guy and player experience over short-term financial pressures, a yeah. development mindset that many fans say Activision this, Blizzard I feel like, had a bank. Do you guys feel like this was kind of a shot at Blizzard? So, this, so Mike Morheim, via an interview... We're trying to create a haven for creators who want an environment that is development-friendly, values product, and player experience over short-term financial pressures. I feel like this was kind of a shot at Blizzard on his way out here, maybe, because he's. I feel like he's sort of, he's sort of stating here that this is no longer the case. He's not getting this from Activision Blizzard at this point. That's why he's making his own development studio pressures a development mindset that's the that way i took it and say activision blizzard had abandoned long ago chris metzen would later found war chief gaming which is dedicated to developing worlds and tabletop experiences and outside of world of warcraft the former second yeah. director ben brode would launch the game studio second dinner X i i loved the energy that ben brode brought to hearthstone this guy, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Ben Brode. Uh, I think he did a Marvel card game, Marvel Snap, but this guy was always like the, the, the life of the party, as it were, with the, the interviews, and he also did some of the announcement at BlizzCon. I think it was, I think it was a big loss to Blizzard when they lost uh, Ben Brode as well. 
Uh, Metellias is as well. Thank you for the Prime. StarCraft 2 developers would join Frost Giant and work towards developing a new RTS. And Lightforge game was opened by former Blizzard engineer Matt Shambari and would later partner with Dreamhaven. Morheim would be just one of many longtime talent leaving the company in recent years, and his departure would be instrumental in what would later be known as Brain Drain afflicting yep. the developer. The Brain Slow. Drain. And uh, Mike Morheim was also the second of three founders to leave. No, the first of the three founders. It was Mike Morheim, Frank Pierce, and Alam Adham. We'll see uh, Frank Pierce here. I think, it, yeah, it's right here. Holy but surely, the people who made did I show, what did I say were, Frank Pierce were yet? departing. This rash of departures would be downplayed as ordinary for the world of game development. And Adham left and recently, too. more about the team rather than individual members. But internally, employees shared a different story. Rather that these people were irreplaceable mentors, and that they drew inspiration from each other, and that each departure I'm sure. would be accompanied by a negative, cascading effect to those left behind. I'm sure. I've said this before. It's very easy to look at a, a developer as a name on a building, but these teams are comprised of people, and I'm sure that a huge, huge part of themselves go into these games. And I, I'm sure, you know, when, whenever uh, a team member leaves... You know, you're you're not only losing a a worker on the game, you're losing a, a large part of the soul of the of the game that they're working on. It's it's not so simple to say, all right, I'm going to work for someone else and replace me with you know, humans are they're unique, they're creative, they have unique ideas, and they bring they bring something to the table to these games. Um, dark, the Dark Souls series would be very different if a different development team of From Software worked on it. World of Warcraft would be much different if back in 1999 it was a completely different group of people and just months later yeah here's another frank co-founder pierce. frank pierce would be the next to announce his departure leaving just alan adam yep. as the last co-founder standing and he left this year he left early yeah there you go both both are says in chat here left in 2004 came back in 2016 and then he left again this year so the original founders of Blizzard are all gone now at this point. Development with Classic was progressing steadily, and a release date for the summer of 2019 was announced. A new game within the Warcraft franchise was oh, also no. revealed. Warcraft 3 Reforged oh, no. would advertise oh, fully remodeled characters and animations, as well as retuned maps and campaigns oh, in this no. modern day remaster, with a set release year of 2019. This would later be delayed to January 2020 in an official post, setting delays in development and the desire to retain a high quality standard that the player base held them to. <laughs> Though not pertaining to the World of Warcraft directly, it would transpire with the oh, development no. of Warcraft 3 and other titles, revealed the priorities and development practices of Blizzard as a whole, and set the standard of how they would treat their community across all franchises, World of Warcraft included. This was also yeah, the this, this isn't just WoW. This is Blizzard culture as a whole at this point. Uh, Warcraft does not equal World of Warcraft, of course, but you know, this is this is Blizzard as a dev studio. This is Activision Blizzard as a culture across all their the games. The Diablo game, which was met with uh, a less than desirable reception. I feel bad for Wyatt. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys all have phones. Phone, right? well, that's a story for another time. <laughs> oh, to make no. Matters worse, the following years, oh, no. financially successful, would prove to be the most damaging to their reputation. Though reaching historic oh, no. revenue earnings, My heart. treatment of their employees would become the focus of negative press. In February of 2019, 800 employees would be fired, yeah. many without warning, and were left crying in the parking I lot. I, I believe I haven't not looked into this news, but at the time we're watching this video, a huge layoffs after the Microsoft merger as well, and I think also kind of similar story. Blindsided, I think a lot of these employees were blindsided; they had no idea the trend that they were going to continue lose their jobs. The following years of record-breaking profits, with massive layoffs and multi-million-dollar CEO bonuses following shortly after. In one yeah. instance, employees would be given gift cards to the games that they just got fired from work. This is this is very insulting. Hey, I feel. Here's some Overwatch skins. You're fired, by the way. And here's some cases, skins for the game the that you just got fired, fired from working would on. Be underreported. Combined with the poor reception of the Battle for Azeroth, the reputation had quickly started to yeah. sour from that of a community-first industry it... innovator to one operated on greed, predatory business practices 
and the cold treatment of their employees and even their player base. It was honestly like being a, a Blizzard WoW content creator was like, um, I'm very grateful to be in the position I'm in, but it was very controversial. You would not believe the comments I would get on my video or like on streams for streaming the game, um, largely due to what's going to be coming up here in a moment. I'll save this thought for right here. But yeah, being a Blizzard content creator, uh, what would happen a lot of the times is all of this controversy would trickle down to you. And there'd be people who'd be, you know, angry at you for making videos about Blizzard games. Little did everyone know, though, the worst was yet to come. Oh, God. Yeah, this was bad. Since 2008, they had hosted an esports event called the Arena World Championship or AWC, where high-end competitive players would face off in a tournament-style competition of the game's arena mode for cash prizes, ranging from $120,000 oh. since its inception in 2008 to $280,000 in 2018. For 2019, however, they had announced a special campaign where players would be able to contribute to the ever-growing prize pool. Two new toys, the Transmorpher Beacon and some faction-themed yeah. fireworks, were pay, made to be available in the in-game cash. Pay very close attention to the wording here. Stop. And to encourage sales, 25% of the proceeds would contribute towards the contribute. prize pool of both the Arena World Championship and also the Mythic Dungeon International, stating that the support of the players would help take the WoW esports scene mm -hmm. to the next level. They also assured that a minimum price pool of 500000 would be offered, split up evenly between the two events. Yep. Considering that all announcements used verbiage such as help or contribute, the player base had assumed that this $500,000 prize pool would be funded by Blizzard what a bunch of they idiots. had done for a decade prior, and that the proceeds of the toy Why would someone would, do such a thing? Well, contribute to the total, as stated. After the camp... What? Who would ever come to that conclusion when they say that for 10 years prior, Blizzard funding their own tournament, and then for this year, saying that by them buying toys, they will help and contribute to the prize pool. How foolish, how foolish it is to assume that Blizzard totally won't scam the player base into funding the entirety of the prize pool by themselves. Campaign had concluded, though, fans were dismayed to learn that they didn't help nor contribute as Blizzard pocketed what they would usually put up yep. and put the responsibility on funding the entirety of the price Yoink. pool on the player base as confirmed by an AWC participant, Snuts. Yeah. So, so let, let's rephrase this. So yeah. people gave Blizzard so much money. I'm reacting to Asmongold content. It's everything's come full circle. Blizzard decided to give themselves even more. Right. So they collected around two point six million dollars, give right. or take, and um, instead of adding prize money for themselves, they just pocketed two million yep. and decided to just use the money that the community gave us and Bobby's pay world for their tournament. Oh my god! Both competitors <laughs> and viewers expressed their anger, stating that they had felt deceived and that it the was. nature of those wishing to support Ab the esports community Absolutely. of Blizzard were taken advantage of. Where loyalty backfires, I'll say again. Where loyalty backfires. Blizzard trust. Would never acknowledge the country. Don't, don't trust video game developers. Don't be loyal to them. If you care about if you care about the video game developer, you always hold them to a quality standard. Mercy. And the prize pools were funded solely by the crowdfunding campaign and despite the self proclaimed Not to put that on the I mean this was misleading, not to put on, on the people who bought the toys like it's their fault for being tricked. I'm not saying that, but... Success in raising the funds... Just in general. such as this would not be repeated for future tournaments. Fanboys are not fans. Due to the intense backlash that they received. Fanboys are not fans because they have no quality standards. Fanboys reduce the quality of games, TV shows, movies, whatever. Um... Yeah, this was a very stupid move, though, from from every perspective. You could say that, okay, they just wanted to make a little bit of extra money, save money, pocket the money, whatever. They have not, despite the fact that this was a massively successful campaign, they have not repeated it since because there's, there. can you imagine? If they were to do the same thing, what are people going to say? Everybody's going to bring up the, uh, was this 2019? 2019 AWC scandal. 
Um, this could have been something that they could have done every year for all of their esports divisions to 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 boost up the prize pool, and it could have been, you know, a community event, and you can support the esports scene of your favorite game, and at the same time get some toys or some some cool stuff in the process. But they haven't repeated it since. It was it was a huge mistake from every from every perspective. Uh oh, here we go. This is, yeah, this is where there's just one thing after another at this point. World of Warcraft wasn't their only franchise that would be at the center of controversy as soon after yeah. their Hearthstone division would attract the attention of national media. Here's a story which just won't go away. Yep. Division Blizzard. This was it nationwide. Has suspended a gamer and taken his prize money away because he made comments supporting Hong Kong protesters. The protests in Hong Kong. Were so th this wasn't um, World of Warcraft, but again, it's it's important to mention because you know this is this is Activision Blizzard as a whole. This this was absolutely huge controversy, and I, I remember um, speaking more of that thought earlier about um, as being a Blizzard or a, yeah a Blizzard content creator making WoW videos, doing WoW streams, uh, trickle-down controversy effect. When this, like, hit Reddit and stuff, people were out for blood. Um, probably similar in a way to the Hogwarts legacy controversy, where, you know, you, you would have people who would, like, go to streams and uh, basically harass, harass the streamers, harass the channels, shaming them into making videos about Blizzard products, streaming about Blizzard products. I call them cry bullies. Um, it's basically people behaving very, very toxic under this guise of some sort of righteous motive. Um, during the, this wasn't Activision Blizzard, but during the Hogwarts Legacy thing, there were people who were like getting lists of streamers tracking who is streaming Hogwarts Legacy in order to basically harass them. Um, yeah, it's just people... It's, I feel like it's in a lot of ways it's very disingenuous. I, I dealt with this a lot when this came out. A huge controversy streaming World of Warcraft during this. Um, it's, I feel like it's people basically looking away to exercise power or to shame others to make themselves feel righteous in a socially acceptable way at the time. Um, I think a lot of the times it's just toxic and it's hypocritical too, because this was all against China and everything, right? So, you know, all these people, instead of, if they really wanted to make a difference, they would stop buying products from China. They would um, buy, you know, locally made products, whether it be in America or Europe or whatever, if they really, really want to take a, a stand against social injustice. But what they did instead is they got on, they sat on their chair, made made in China, typed on their com their keyboard, made in China, and used their mouse, which was made in China, in order to shame and um, exercise power over others to make themselves feel better. Because that's much easier to do. It's much easier to tell other people what they should be doing than to actually do something yourself, because to do something yourself is much more inconvenient um, this is a huge controversy here, but yeah, I just wanted to talk about, uh, and obviously that's not the biggest issue at play here. I don't mean to give that impression, but that's my thoughts on these online mobs that, that, that basically use these controversies in order to harass people. They hide behind the guise of some righteous movement in order to harass people. That's what I think. At their climax at this point. Texas Pie, thank you. British colony until 1997, when sovereignty of the territory was returned to China, Hong Kong would retain a separate legal and economic system this, yeah. with basic human rights safeguarded 100%. in contrast to other cities in China, which are heavily governed by the authoritarian central yeah. government. Though in March of 2019, a bill would be proposed that would allow extraditions of fugitives to mainland China, which infringed on these rare freedoms. The, yeah, this would be and due to Chinese abuse. opaque legal system would allow the prosecution of citizens for political purposes. 
Citizens held marches and protests, which quickly turned violent yeah. after they were fired upon with tear gas, rubber bullets, pepper spray, and even live rounds as the situation spiraled out of control. Yeah, and but not to make like the poor content creator the major issue. This is the major issue here, what's going on in Hong Kong. I don't mean to make it like that, but I'm just saying that you know, people use stuff like this as an as an excuse to treat others poorly. And it's very uh, it's very detrimental to the uh, movement or the quote side that they claim to be fighting for, because the average person looking into this controversy are now like seeing like how mean they treat others. Oh, I, th I feel like the whole Hogwarts legacy fiasco is is a perfect example of that. Like Hogwarts Legacy, that got so toxic and so crazy. Same year, a tournament competitor, Jung Nai Wan, or Blitz Chung, after a victory, took out a face mask similar to those being worn by the Hong Kong protesters and voiced his support to them, quoted, Liberate Hong Kong, the revolution of our times. <laughs> yeah. The feed was quickly cut, and the following huge, day, huge. Blizzard announced that Blitz Chung had been banned he from banned. competing further in the tournament. They really in addition dropped the to hammer on him. The prize money that he had won up until that point, totaling ten thousand dollars. Additionally, he would be banned from competing for a full year, and the two casters interviewing Blitz Chung at the time would also be fired. As uh, thank you, Texas, by the way. But yeah, that yeah, this was huge. I when, I happened to be streaming when all of this happened. And uh, like my uh, my YouTube channel, Twitch channel, everything was like brigaded with basically you're you're this evil person for streaming WoW. As a result, trying to trying to shame me and other people into I don't know not making WoW content or whatever. Activision Blizzard would swiftly come under heavy but criticism. This was yeah as, many time as, morality as they should by the way. Invested financial interests, players of another team. I'm um, I feel like they're just, they're too heavy, right? To take away the prize money was like totally, totally unnecessary. American University would add their voices to the protest, which was also quickly censored and condemned by Blizzard. Spirit. And that is game WPI with the win. The winners just... Similar to Blitzchung, they would also be banned from competing in future tournaments, this time for six months. Shortly after, then President J. Allen Brack released a statement saying that the penalties were not appropriate and that Blitz Chung's winnings would be reinstated to him and that his ban would be reduced to six months yeah. down from 12 and also state that their business dealings with China which is, had no influence on the initial penalties. Which is a complete lie, by the way. Brack would an, an absolute lie. I mean, of course, they Tencent owned a, a stake within them and the the penalties were so harsh they they lessened them but yeah open up the following blizzcon with an apology to the mishandling of the situation stating that their actions would speak louder than words but our actions are going to matter more than any of these words you you don't look towards video game developers companies for lessons of morality but again the issue here the issue is this is what Blizzard built. This was this was the culture of Blizzard is like, yeah, we're all together in this. We're all a community and everything. So, you know, it's you, there are positive aspects to that, but there's negative aspects to that as well. If if you're if you're much more focused on community and um, you know, being so close with your audience, you have to you have to prepare yourself for the negative aspects as well as the positive aspects, and this is where you know it, it blows back. A phrase that the Blizzard community would quickly become. This was just like another another controversy. Very familiar with. In the huge controversy. Blizzcon, the new expansion for World of Warcraft would also be revealed. Players would enter the Shadowlands and join factions called Covenants. Similar to the Order Halls in Legion, these would serve as a base of operations for players to conduct their campaign and also gain unique abilities and perks. They would also explore the Tower of Torghast, a randomized one to three player dungeon crawl with powerful affixes to power up their characters, and upon completion, gain the ability to craft legendary armor pieces 
similar in function to those of the Legion expansion, though following the poor reception of the battle for Azeroth, many more would look at the reveal through a more critical lens. Yeah. Classic baby. So I will say here, I'll preference this video was made late 2021. So at this point, I, uh, I quit Shadowlands very early on and I was all in on classic at this point. Though their current projects were met with mixed reactions, World of Warcraft Classic had seen its release in August of 2019 to surprising success. Initially holding only a handful of servers, it was quickly overwhelmed and new servers were created to hold the surprising amount of people that had longed for the Azeroth of years long past. Upon launch, interest was so underestimated that queue times would balloon up to several hours and even months following the release for some of the highest population servers. Some aspects of the game would age well, such as a renewed sense of community and a heavy yep. focus on Vanilla. traditional RPG elements and other aspects such as a solved and archaic rating scene and an eventual stagnation of content would yep. remain to be problem areas within the game as well as botting. Botting. As grew in popularity, dun, 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 dun. so too did third-party websites yep. offering in-game items Still a problem to this day. in exchange for real money, a practice that's against the game's terms of service. These Still. sites oftentimes use automated programs to obtain Still an issue today. And Blizzard would be ineffective in controlling them throughout the duration of Classic. Oh god, even yeah, though the they were relatively farm. easy to spot by the players, as displayed many times by content creators within the community. I found a warrior mob grinding in Tanaris <laughs> having a bit of trouble getting to his target. Cheating <laughs> had always been, and continues to be, an area where Blizzard would perform poorly, even in the current version of the game, but due to the more fragile nature of the economy in World of Warcraft Classic and its community, it would have greater negative consequences. Though cheating was to remain a problem area, this is outside ZG. traditional design and the absence Fly of hackers. many now deemed to be an overly intrusive cash shop, it proved to hold the attention of a wide player base yeah. consistently um, through its year and a half run. Though um, Classic was so different from retail at this point, and I, I think that's what, why that's good that WoW runs... You know, you have Dragonflight and you have Classic WoW. They're so different that they kind of... They kind of um, they they please two different audiences and uh that's another reason why i think you know it was, it was kind of a mistake to release the level boost slash wow token in the original classic line because you're a lot of the people who play wow were sort of alienated in a large way by what i just mentioned there the the, the cash shop so it's it's sort of like I feel like classic wrath and cataclysm with all of its changes that's going to be closer classic classic cataclysm is going to be closer to retail wow than it will be to classic wow due to just cataclysm as an expansion and also the the very gameplay altering microtransactions the wow tokens the level boosts not every the the cash shop is a big part of the culture of retail wow re-release was to be met with the same success before Saad gets a cash up? I don't know. I'd knock on wood. Oh, God. Warcraft yep. 3 reforged Saad's release in the following January. Though delayed as they ensured to maintain a high quality standard, it was universally met with negative reviews as players yeah. saw little polish with the remaster, setting a poor UI, it was rushed. copious bugs, a low frame rate, missing features from the original, and consistent crashes. The latter of these issues the e would take the died on release the competitive for scene shortly after. Warcraft 3. In their very first major tournament, in a quarterfinal match between two top players, Moon and Thorzane, a crash occurred at a key moment. The score was 1-1, and Thorzane seemed to be on track to take the win, but suffered a disconnect mid-match. There, there was a push for esports for Warcraft 3 Reforged. It ended very quickly, <laughs> as you'll see. Man, smells blood in the water. He's going in for the kill here. We have banners ready. Mountain King was a little hurt. This is all buying time for the towers. We have no breath of fire, by the way. It is drunken haze. So big mischance on these dragon hawks and a disconnect. Oh no! The most important one in this game yet. The match would then be restarted, despite Thorzane's advantage and he would once again retake control of the rematch and once again suffered a disconnect. Yep. I don't, I don't need this is the next one. Try again. 
once this Nope. You can hear the people like in the crowd. Drop. Just happens. Yeah, it's so frustrating. Astorzain, I think I kind of like his position here in this game. Yeah, he was winning at this, this point. Is so frustrating. Thorzain, be Thorzain had the upper hand, and Moon, having adapted to Thorzain's strategy at this point, was the one to take the lead and eliminated Thorzain, yeah. resulting in the forfeiture of the large prize pool. He surely would have won twice. Yeah, though they are the most impactful. Maybe saying surely would have won twice—that's a bit much, but. It seemed like he was going to win, and no, no takeaway from Moon. I'm, I'm sure he's a great player too. By the way, I don't say that Moon is like a bad player or anything, but yeah, I mean this, this, this had, had a obviously it affected the match as they happened during a quarterfinal match. These would not be the only disconnects yeah, to occur. The whole tournament, the tournament was wrought with disconnects. Competitors in lower level brackets would also become victim to random drops at key moments. Years later, an internal investigation would reveal that they knowingly released the game in an unfinished state, unwilling to delay it for a second time in fear of losing the pre-orders they had already amassed. They these are um, these are ex-developers saying what what happened with Warcraft 3 Reforged. It was rushed out. They didn't want to lose pre-order sales. That the entire project was hamstrung by a low budget due to its low potential for being a big earner for the company. Internal source. Because no, nobody cares about RTS these days. RTS is a pretty dead genre, so it's like, all right, whatever, just release it. Doesn't matter if it's finished. We want these pre-orders. So it's not a big deal. Share. People don't care. Struggles with exhaustion, anxiety, and depression for more than a year, and at their warnings of the game's unfinished state being largely ignored in order to make the tight release schedule. Negative reviews continued at a steady pace. So don't get on the. I mean. As it said right there, the war, the Reforged devs, they knew it was unfinished. They wanted more time, but um, it was rushed out. They didn't from from whoever I don't know who, but uh, they knew it was unfinished, and the developers said that, and they they released it anyway because they didn't want to lose any more pre-orders because they already had delayed it once at that point, and uh, once it got released, and once it was received poorly. You know what they did? They uh, they fired that uh, that dev team for their poor performance, despite the fact that they said it wasn't ready. As did refunds, as players were less than impressed at the level of polish that they received compared to what was promised. The classic game teams would be shut down, a new team now in their place, and in a bit of irony in a Bloomberg interview, a Blizzard spokesperson repeated the same failed promise made by Brad. Actions speak months louder prior, than words. That their work and actions would speak louder than words. That's true, by the way. Actions do speak louder than words. I mean, he's right. It it wasn't the actions or what was spoken wasn't ideal, but this is absolutely true. Actions do speak louder than words. A delay was also announced with Shadowlands, this time from October to December. Once more citing that extra polish is needed before a release would be made. And, and that was a good call. With the Battle for Azeroth, Blizzard proved that, that was a good call. Many times that selling copies wasn't the problem, as Shadowlands sold an yeah. impressive 3.7 million copies on launch day alone. Much like its predecessor, New record. Though, not long after the initial launch, the expansion's major features would be the focus of criticism. The Tower of Torghast, or Chorghast as players soon likened it to, suffered the same fate as island expeditions from the Battle for Azeroth, and quickly became repetitive, as with most systems that reset on a weekly timer. As for the expand, uh, I'll repeat again, any feature system, no matter how well it's designed, if it's tied to a weekly timer, people will get bored of it. It's just a matter of time. High level zone, the Ma, due to the player's inability to mount, it was the seen Ma. to be unnecessarily frustrating to navigate and formulate to other such zones released in the past. Yeah. By now, players were noticing a pattern in yeah. high level zones with new reputations and excessive daily timers such as quests, regulate enemies, and treasure I, chests. I think this, they kind of went too crazy. I believe one of the first times they did this was uh, the Timeless Isle of Mists of Pandaria. Like this loot island where you have rares, you have treasure chests, maybe a new reputation. Because they did that in Draenor with, um, uh, uh, what's the name of the, the, the new Hellfire, the new uh, Hellfire Peninsula. 
for Draenor that held Hellfire Citadel. That was one of these end level zones with like chests and rares and stuff. Um, Legion had uh, Suramar and also Argus, Tannen Jungle. There you go. Yeah, Tannen Jungle with like the Apexis crystals and stuff. Uh, Legion had at first Suramar, but then uh, Argus was like another high level zone with rares and treasures. BFA was, um, I believe, uh, was was the the Naj Najjatar or whatever. The, the the Naga zone. That was another high level zone with rares and treasures. I believe also Mechagon as well, the, the Mechagon zone. Um and going into BF no, that was BFA. But yeah, Shadowlands with the Ma. It kind of became formulaic at that point. I think Timeless Isle when it was released, it was like really successful, but it kind of got to a point to where you know, people kind of knew what to expect and they weren't being surprised at Covenant, and they received a mixed reaction, with some praising the unique abilities and aesthetics obtained from choosing a specific faction, and others condemning them for being unbalanced, thus burdening them with regret if they had made a poor choice. Some people's classes, 40% yeah. of their damage is just their Covenant ability. They're all over the place. They're a mess. Some would also take They're very imbalanced. issue with being locked out of a large amount of content offered from the other covenants, as choosing one meant excluding three others, though a time-gated quest was available should they feel the need to switch. There's there are like elements of that I don't really mind. Going back to my thoughts earlier on like Pallies for Alliance and Horde for Shaman, I don't mind having like meaningful choices, but it was so it was so tied it was so critical for character progression that it, it just ended up not being received too well. But it's, 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 um, this is really all I can say about Shadowlands though, because like I said, I, I quit early Shadowlands. I know that covenants were eventually changed after this video was released. I can't comment on that though, cause I, I had stopped early Shadowlands. For better or for worse, Blizzard would stand their ground at launch, but also stated that they had the ability to pull the ripcord to give players- Oh God, the ripcord, you guys remember that? Should the systems be received poorly. This comment the would ripcord. start a movement called Pull the Ripcord, which they would comply to nearly a year later in patch 9.1.5. Yeah. As for the story, many would see it as even worse than that of the Battle for Azeroth expansion. The plot somehow became even more confusing and contradictory. I will never serve, despite the fact that she served, as even did YouTube nothing but serve. dedicated to the lore of the game had difficulty piecing together the disorienting storylines. They would not be shy in expressing their frustration. Uh -oh. How many books are you gonna fucking get out of me? How much money am I gonna pay before I can finally explain the lore to the people that want to know about it to the degree that it's actually comprehensible? I will never serve. <laughs> <laughs> Major cutscenes. Yeah, the lore channels weren't in a very good state at by the time Shadowlands came around. The lore channels were kind of losing losing their minds a little bit. Would continue to be unlisted on their YouTube channel oh, in God. response to the negative reception. Only time will tell of the fate of the Shadowlands. Not a good time for lore channels. Or a bad expansion. But it, players are it was bad. The similarities between it, it, and it ended up being bad. Again, this video was finished during the midst of Shadowlands. It ended up being pretty bad. And the battle for Azeroth where the major systems are released in a poorly implemented state, only to be addressed in patches several months later, and many at this point would take notice to a rising contender within the MMO genre. Over the years, Final Fantasy XIV would slowly but surely 14. gain a sizable subscriber base. Following a failed initial launch in 2010, after listening to player yeah. feedback, the 14 MMO was sucked remade on in many ways and relaunched in 2013. It would see steady growth due to these improvements and also the shortcomings of the world of Warcraft. And as players became increasingly embittered with Shadowlands, they started migrating over, including major streamers and YouTube channels, creating more tension within the already tribalistic MMO community as players. Yeah, the developers uh, actually uh, started firing back here on Twitter. Content this, this, was, uh, this was a pretty big controversy and even employees would take shots at each other over social media. It got toxic. Though subscriptions remained to be hidden, third-party analytics began favoring Final Fantasy XIV to be the most active MMO. Um, this is debatable. Because neither of these MMOs 
release their subscription numbers. So it's you can only like really use third party websites add ons to kind of gauge it. Fourteen has kind of it. It's been up there. It's been debatable. Nobody truly knows if it ever surpassed it, but that was the thinking. During the worst of Shadowlands, the thinking was that 14, for the first time since 2004, became the, mo quote, most popular MMO. But yeah, there's no way to confirm it. With Blizzard even sending out surveys, attempting to gauge interest in it, for the first time in many years, it was becoming clear to many that the world of Warcraft was losing its hold on the genre. Absolutely. That, that, that line is true though it was it was clear it was losing its hold on the genre oh god oh i think i have to go you guys i'm not sure if i can finish this video it's treason <laughs> my heart how many people are playing wrath classic right now at blizzcon 2020 the next step for classic was announced and as many expected players would begin their second journey into the outland in the burning crusade classic there's going to be a lot of i told you so's right here just so you guys know much like the base game the first expansion would be recreated closely to its original run in 2007 but with one exception the addition of a major cash shop element the character boost we are going to offer a level 58 bo boost for purchase, but it does come with some restrictions. It's treason, so it's going to then. be one per account. Um, it's not going to be usable on Blood Elf or Drain Eye. Um, it'll have some... Uh. For many players, the feeling of anticipation was quickly replaced by that of betrayal, as character boosts, among other paid services such yeah. as the WoW token, were specifically stated not to be released in the classic version of the game. This was a uh, Reddit before before um, classic WoW released. People were like, "All right, you're not gonna fuck us, right?" And they're like, "Oh no, we won't." We won't. Come on, we never do it. We would never break any hearts. As they didn't exist back then. Ultimately, we want to stay true with the uh, with the conventions of classic. The character boost would be a one-use service, bringing any character to level 58, and was offered in a bundled package that also included other digital rewards, including a mount, a pet, and a toy. Ignoring. Can you hear the monotone screeching? The fact that they had lied. Blizzard would pitch that it was intended for new players who didn't have the time to level. Um, there's a lot of my friends, for example, who, who maybe um, didn't really play Classic when it first yeah. came out, right? And so now they're behind. Um, and they're interested Mama. in playing the Burning Crusade. We want to make sure that... I The way I like to develop my games is to uh, develop it around the people who don't want to play it. My favorite way to play video games is to pay $15 a month to play it and then to pay even more money to not play it by buying level boosts and WoW tokens. It's my favorite. But those people are served too. Uh, and one of the ways we could do that is provide a, a boost mm -hmm. uh, to, to people who are interested in coming back. Though this was contradicted in the fact that the service was purchasable by everyone, even by those yeah. who already had. Yeah, this is for new players, but everybody can buy it. High level characters. In addition to the boost, Blizzard had also announced classic era servers for those who preferred the vanilla state of the game. But this too would be met with controversy, as there would be a $35 charge. This is insane. That was ab I could not believe it. So what we're talking about here is they released classic era, which is still going, right? Um, but they they wanted to charge people to copy over their. Because all the all the characters go to BC, right? And those BC characters went to Wrath. They wanted to charge the people to copy to Era thirty five dollars. It's it's no longer microtransactions. What's micro about both it? Both states of the games as characters that players spent the past year and a half leveling and gearing would be dangled in front of their faces in the login screen yeah. behind the paywall. You don't want to lose this the character. The was immediate. Yeah. And Blizzard it's... would respond by lowering the charge to $15, down from 35 As for the boost, the community was quick to point out the dangers of releasing such a service, such as the abandonment of the old world. And mm, who box, did this? Which had already been a major problem. In who made Classic, this video, I wonder? Powered with the ability to skip towards the end game making them capable of farming higher level materials almost immediately, thus mm -hmm. having a greater negative effect than they previously had. Which 100% happened, by the way. 
Many also warned that except for the service nature access <laughs> would lead classic down the same familiar road and that it would suffer the same fate of the game that spawned its existence. Do you guys remember with, anybody in saying this? To creating an unfair Who said this? element that let players pay to skip what other players had already worked for. Though these worries would ultimately be ignored and the level boost was released despite the backlash. Footage of boosted Look at all these natural players in the world. To appear Those are all players. Literally every single bot without fail was a level 58 boosted character. The limitation of one per account for bots is completely irrelevant. As expected mm -hmm. for them, it's just a huge time save yeah. from actually having to level. And many People stars. actually argued against that. I showed math, basic arithmetic, showing that it was... Uh, I think it was 98 times more financially lucrative to buy a boost and use that character to RMT than it was to level a character from 1 to 60. And people said, oh, Mad Season, you're the Alex Jones of World of Warcraft. You don't know what you're talking about. The WoW token won't be released. Where are those people now? I don't like about a level boost in the game. That make the friggin' game, though. Uh, 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 sick of this crap. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of I told you so's. On Old World, now abandoned, as the boost now loaded the majority of the player base directly into the Outland. One of the core design philosophies of Classic yeah. had been betrayed. A large portion of the player base at this point were refugees from current World of Warcraft, due to in large part of the overzealous cash shop, which was promised to be absent in the recreation. Shortly after, a WoW token with the green mm. burning crusade background was data mined, and players took to the forums, creating numerous threads asking for confirmation whether this was planned to be released in Classic, and once more, were simply ignored. Mm. Interesting. To this day, several months later, there's no confirmation, yes or no, of their plans to implement it into the game. This betrayal proved to be the final straw for- Hmm. Interesting. Uh... Interesting. I wonder if there's a monotone content creator out there who said at this point that maybe the WoW token would eventually be released, who many people said was, was absolutely wrong. I uh, just, I don't know, no names come to mind. What do you guys think? For many of the player base, including the highly intelligent, not monotone, and physically attractive <laughs> YouTube user, Matt Jason Show. Hey, there it is. After 16 years playing and seven years on YouTube, had announced his retirement. Oh uh, yeah, we're back playing, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I will have you note, I am playing a version of the game that has no level boosts or WoW tokens. Okay. Yes, I uh, actually we should talk about this. Actually, let's take a little moment. So, um, ninety nine point nine percent of you guys have been really supportive of me coming back, and I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, but there's there has been a you know a selection of cultists who are very very salty about it and they first off I want to say this gatekeeping like who's really a fan in a video game anything past the age of 16 is really really cringe um but I I think that the better the bigger fan of a video game is the person who, when they feel like they're not achieving a quality standard, they unsubscribe and they stop supporting it. And if they feel like they later return to a quality standard, then they once again decide to give them their time and money. Um, I quit playing Classic WoW for a large reason due to the level boost because I felt like it was going to lead to the WoW token. Told you so, by the way. Um, but I started back with Hardcore wo Mode, which had no level boost, no WoW token, and now Sod, which has no level boost and no WoW token. That never forget the, again, this gets into the loyalty thing. Loyalty, if you actually care about a video game developer, you throw loyalty out the door. Because no matter what happens, people are, again, it's easy to look at a name on a building as a developer and just think, okay, that's, that's Blizzard Entertainment. That's, um, that's uh, I don't know, Disney, whatever. Any, any form of entertainment in media. But these developers are comprised of people. And people, unfortunately, they're temporary. They move on, they quit, they get fired, they pass away. Um, and eventually, uh, in, in the world of video game development, while a developer at one point may have a lot of heart and a lot of uh, focus on the art... 
eventually these people will either move on or get replaced by people who will take under their development name and then use the loyalty that the previous people have earned um, against the player base. I feel like this is the exact same thing true with From Software. People worship From Software today. But it, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it could be a year from now, it could be five years, it could be ten years. Eventually, the people who are holding the line on From Software and creating these amazing games and putting a, a, a high value on the art of the game, they will be replaced by greedy businessmen. And all of these people who, who operate on loyalty with video game developers, they will be... Um, their, their loyalty and their good nature will be wielded against them in order to get them to buy inferior products because they know that they will buy anything. So speaking on this, this idea of true fans of the video game, you know, yeah, I did. I stopped playing World of Warcraft once I felt like I wasn't getting um, the, the return that I felt like I should have been getting. And I, I didn't have trust that they would be able to provide a, a quality experience. And now I'm playing again in 2023. In August 2023 is when I started playing again. Once I looked at hardcore and I thought to myself, okay, well, that looks cool. Based on my feeling that I'll have a, a return from this, I will subscribe again. Um, and the whole quitting thing, you know, I, I mean, of course, I run a a World of Warcraft channel. I can't just out of nowhere, after making 600 videos for World of Warcraft without any explanation, quit and not say why. I have to, I have to tell people, okay, I'm quitting the game and I'm quitting the game for these reasons. So there, there is some controversy with my return and you'll see people out there who will, who will say like, oh, I thought you quit. Yeah, I did quit. I quit when I thought the game wasn't giving me uh, the proper return for my money. And, I'm come, and I've come back now that I feel like they are. That's sort of how consumerism should work and if you're somebody who operates on loyalty that's bad that's bad for the developer because you you fanboys are not good fans because they have no quality standards you need to have people who hold developers uh movie movie makers directors whatever to quality standards in order to maintain quality because again although they may be very very passionate and they may be very good at one point um Eventually, there'll come, a, there'll come a time to where the only thing that'll keep them at that quality standard will be the fan base, will be the players. It won't be the game designer or developer who has a, a really, really high appreciation for the art of their game or having integrity for their game. So, again, I think it's very cringe above the age of 16 to like, say who's a true fan or not. But again, playing by these people's rules, I think I'm a, a far better... Uh, fan slash subscriber of Blizzard than the people who, you know, who bought BFA, who bought Shadowlands, and then pre-ordered the Super Mega Ultra Deluxe Edition of Dragonflight when they they had no they had no actual reason to believe that it was going to be to hit that quality standard. And soul now ripped away. That that to me is the true sign of addiction. Being able to separate and say, hey, you know what? I'm not I'm not having fun with this. I'm not getting my money's worth. Quitting, and then coming back when you feel like you will get that return. I think people have that backwards. That's what I think. Hey, once more, Classic's population began to wane drastically. And again, uh, speaking more of like, everybody saying that level boosts are so good for the game. What's, what's this? Pre-level boost, post-level boost. Again, like... Every, every single metric shows that paying for character progression in a genre of games centered around character progression equals bad. It makes people quit. It doesn't bring, you know, this huge swath of people into the game. It drives people away because the people who don't want to, the people who actually do want to level, they feel stupid leveling in the old world when they can just click a button that you can pay $50 and have a high level character. And the remaining players would comment on the second foray into the Outland becoming more and more empty with each passing day. Some of those who remained chose to rebel by targeting other players. Oh yeah, who this I remember the level boost bundle <laughs> by performing an in-game emote slash fit on Rip anyone spit. Seen riding the deluxe edition mount. In response, Blizzard disabled the emote when targeting another player. All right, let's see if we can spit on someone. 
You can no longer spit on people. You can only spit on the ground. Wow. Foreign threads <laughs> expressing concern with Classic's future were ultimately ignored. But to a community that acted against Whale the watcher. interests, Blizzard's response would be immediate and clear. It was revealed yeah. later that Omar Gonzalez, who was one of the few responsible for taking action and making the classic recreation Is he quit too? had Last suddenly Omar. taken leave from Blizzard to join Secret Door under Dreamhaven, contributing to the ever-growing list of people who didn't quit developing Asimus games, height. but rather Asimus height. developing games for Blizzard Entertainment. Not long after, Jeff Kaplan, this was huge. Oh Blizzard my God! And director of Overwatch announced his departure. Kaplan was like, this. This was very telling to me. Jeff Kaplan, the face of Overwatch, you you could just tell this guy like Overwatch was his baby. It was it was it was his child. Um, he left during the development of Overwatch Two. This really told me a lot. This was very, very telling with how much Kaplan cared about Overwatch to leave during the development of Overwatch 2 was extremely telling. This news would come as a surprise to the community. Shoutouts to Dino Flask. The sequel to Overwatch, Overwatch 2, was still in development. Kaplan himself had gained the reputation as a leader and wholly passionate about his craft. So to leave a project before even seeing its release yeah. came off as abnormal. And many feared that to say the least, that normal wrong with Blizzard behind closed doors. And prior to this, uh -oh. other industry veterans since its release. Yeah, this this is all. Alex Afrasiabi would also quietly drop from the company in June of 2020. The manner of it which says he left. I'm out. pretty sure he was forced, like he was going to be fired. Maybe they gave him the opportunity to quit or something. However, was or maybe also that normal. Maybe maybe he was fired. I don't know. This I mean, it's a random WoW wiki article, so. There's a lot of fog around his departure, and you'll find out. You'll find out in a second, but yeah, this is Blizzard like preparing, preparing for the storm, right? The 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 shit storm that's about to hit. As had been customary with the more invisible warriors, thank you, man. The company taking their leave. There was no farewell post, nor even an acknowledgement by Blizzard. Though the true reason for his departure would soon become clear. Yep. Cube crawls in which Blizzard in the news again. Drink a lot of alcohol as they crawl yeah. their way through the cubicles, often engaging in inappropriate behavior <laughs> towards female employees. Yeah. The agency saying it seeks, among other remedies, pay adjustments. This is where it gets July real. 23rd, 2021. Activision Blizzard once again became the center of national news as the world would learn the details of a two-year investigation and lawsuit by the state of California of continuous sexual misconduct and discrimination of their employees. The cube crawling. The investigation alleges that female employees in particular were underpaid and subjected to regular sexual harassment by co-workers and superiors. In the report, it was revealed that one employee ultimately committed suicide of Activision. during a company vacation. This would occur after pictures of her vagina had allegedly Jesus been Christ. passed around a company party. The investigation yeah, also described cube crawls, where employees would become intoxicated and pulled to the workplace, subjecting co-workers to unwanted That's sexual terrible. advances, lewd behavior, and make inappropriate comments about rape and other intrusive or yeah. demeaning behavior. The news shocked the Blizzard community and served as the final straw for many as players and content creators began to migrate away, favoring other MMOs such as Final Fantasy XIV. Activision Blizzard's response would be swift and attempted to mitigate the allegations. Very uh, tone deaf response the here. DFEH, the plaintiff in the lawsuit, had distorted their claims and had rushed to file an inaccurate complaint, and that they were sickened and found the manner of which they investigated and reported to be reprehensible, referring specifically that the employee's suicide had no bearing on the case. The response was quickly deemed tone deaf by onlookers Poor Bobby and employees alike who staged a walkout in protest of the allegations and the cold response by their employer. Yeah. Shortly after, Activision CEO Bobby Kotick also denounced the response, stating that it was tone deaf. Wait, and fair keep this and in mind. respectful treatment in the workplace was of the utmost importance. Keep in mind, this is Bobby Kotick denouncing the response. Just hold that in your, in your, in your memory here for a moment. Not long after, he would hire a firm made famous for union busting for Amazon to investigate their HR practices. 
Months later, it was revealed that it was he who had originally drafted the initial response, and having another executive <laughs> sign it in her name, that is... He's like the Eric Cartman of video game CEOs. He wrote the initial response. Once it was obviously addressed as tone deaf, he's like, oh, how could, how could, I'm not sure who's responsible for that, you guys, but oh, how tone deaf of this person to do this. It was fucking Bobby Kotick signing it in someone else's name. Is the very same one that he denounced. It was also revealed that he Holy had shit. knowledge of several sexual assault cases in the workplace and settling them out of court and failing to make them public. In one instance, yeah. he threatened the life of one of his assistants. In response yeah. of this news being made public, there's a lawsuit over that too. I believe his commitment to the safety Not and sure. the quality of his employees. Oh God, that stare! Anyone who doubts my conviction to be the most welcoming and inclusive workplace doesn't really appreciate how important this is to me. In August, the that DFDA whole video is like creepy. Division Blizzard of destroying documents relevant to the investigation in violation of their legal obligation to not tamper with yeah, evidence of an ongoing lawsuit. Allegedly, so they were like be quickly denied by an activist. They were like shredding evidence. Division Blizzard spokesperson. Pictures and conversations relating to the Cosby Suite were also leaked. The nickname for Afrasiabi's hotel room from BlizzCon 2013, after the former comedian Bill Cosby, who had at that point faced multiple accusations of date rape. In an internal email, yeah. President J. Allen Brax stated his respect and care Slimy. for equal treatment, and that Gloria Steinem, a well-known activist for women's rights, was a revered name in his household. This, this is. Uh... Having failed to grind the reputation to reach Exalted. Yeah, imagine not even getting Exalted with Gloria Steinem, the revered feminist. Despite being human and having the diplomacy racial. Yeah. What a casual. What a casual. The response wasn't received very well for some reason, and shortly after, he would step down as president, ending his near three-year tenure, and was replaced with a two-person team, Jen O'Neill and Both Mike of which Ibarra, were no longer there. Of whom would announce her departure just three months later, stating in an email to Activision's legal team of her lack of faith of their ability to change, and that she herself faced sexual harassment earlier in her career at Activision. She also revealed that she was being paid less than her co-leader, and that although equal pay was negotiated by both she and Th Mike Ybarra, it was only offered to her after she announced her- Like, why, why is this a thing? With what's going on right now, they say, well, we're going to have a co-leadership, but we're going to pay Mike more than Jen O'Neill. And Mike, um, from what I understand, Mike Ybarra fought for equal pay, and they just- they wouldn't do it. They said no. And then she said, okay, I'm going to quit. And then they're like, okay, well, I think they offered. Yeah, once she was quitting, then they offered the equal pay. But at that point, she was like, all right, fuck this. Her resignation. She also described attending a 2007 party with Bobby Kotick, where scantily clad women danced on stripper poles. Yeah, well... I'm gonna go build my own game dev studio with blackjack and hookers. As for Mike Ybarra, he would quickly come under controversy not long after his new position for a tweet advertising selling raid carries for gold. While this isn't against the game's terms of service, yeah, this, it I, remains to be a controversial point within the World of Warcraft yeah, community. It speaks a lot of its culture. The line of pay to win due to the player's ability to purchase yeah. gold with real money. As yeah. details of the investigation, and obviously unfolded, not the biggest issue many here. Many employees but... would quit or be fired, including senior game designer. Yeah, Jonathan they cleaned Kraft, house here. The lead level designer of Diablo 4, a level designer of World of Warcraft, as well as the inspiration for the Overwatch character Jesse McCree and Diablo 4's game director Jesse McCree. Who's Riga, that? Was also revealed. Do you to mean no uh, be a Cole Cassidy? Blizzard, leaving the upcoming action RPG without two critical leaders in the middle of its development. In response to McCree's opinion, um, very two so Di Diablo 4 loses game director and lead level designer. Um, Diablo 4 today, I think they just did a new season, so I'm not sure how it was doing, but I think you could, I'm, I'm sure you have to point towards this moment right here as uh, one of the sources of its of its issues. Two critical leaders in the middle of its development in response yeah, did not to McCree's well. involvement in the scandal. It was announced that the character McCree would be renamed, and that once again, actions would speak louder than words. 
Actions speak louder than words, Blizzard guys. At this Come on. Point would also be Do they still say that? Of in-game changes, such as removing items and references, and they deem to be inappropriate yeah. given the circumstances, such as changing pictures of women into fruit. In-game joke. I respect women so much, I replace all pictures of them with fruit. Emotes that were deemed to be highly controversial Come on, you guys. be removed. If there are any children in the room right now, I advise you at this point to cover their ears. I like to fart in the tub. Amidst the oh, how sexist. Tensions were at an all-time high. A senior systems designer of World of Warcraft revealed that almost no work is being oh, done. Oh, this was huge. As the lawsuit was unfolding, this sparked outrage among the player base as yep. they learned that they were paying for content that was no longer being developed. It, again, in an expansion which had already seen updates at a sluggish pace. In response to the backlash, a senior game producer labeled those complaining as part of the problem as employees continued lashing out and placing blame on their players and community figures. Yeah, again, it's the lines blurred between consumer and um, um, consumer and uh, the people who deliver this stuff to be consumed. There's a word for it. I'm I'm having a brain fart right now. Blizzard. But you know, at the end, obviously, there are bigger issues at play here, but. You, you still have to, people are paying for your service. You can't use this as, all right, we're not doing any work on the game and you guys continue to pay us $15 a month. Would see. There, there, there should be no favors within, the, within the, the relationship between consumer and producer. No favors. It's, it's, is your product worth buying? Yes or no. If it is, you pay for it. If it isn't, you don't pay for it. That's how the relationship should be. And the lines between that and, and Blizzard and many other video game developers tend to get blurred from both ends. This was this was the, the line being blurred from that particular employee thinking that, you know, trying to shame the player for being upset that they're paying for a product that's no longer being developed in an expansion that was already seeing a very sluggish pace of content releases. A major restructuring of their teams during this time as these employees either quit or were fired, many of which holding important positions in games that were in mid-development, causing major delays in production. Yeah. In November of 2021, it was revealed by Blizzard Chief Financial Officer Armin Serza that the company isn't planning to include both Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4 in their 2022 financial outlook report, indicating that neither release will see their debut in all of 2022 due to delays in development. Uh, I don't... Did Overwatch 2 release in 2022? Or was that 20? I feel like Overwatch 2 was released in 2022. So maybe they, they jumped the gun a little bit on that one. As a result, financially, they would suffer their yeah, this worst was loss huge, in 13 huge years. Huge stock loss. And stock prices fell by more than 14% in a single day. That's a lot. Bringing its year-to-date losses to 25%. In December... Was Overwatch 2 2023? Employees revealed suspicions that their breast milk was being oh stolen. Oh my god. Nursing mothers would label and store packages of breast milk in the break room. It doesn't end. And when retrieving it later, would find that some or all of the milk would be missing while other items in the refrigerator uh, would remain undisturbed. Got Though, milk? As of this video, no evidence exists of the alleged protein-rich caper. <laughs> when reached out for comment, an Activision Blizzard spokesperson replied, stating that there's no use crying over spilt milk. I think the there was like a 4chan post predating the reveal of that. It was an, an anonymous poster on 4chan who stated that he worked for a big tech company and that he would steal the breast milk from the fridges of his employees work for protein or something for gains. And it happened like a few months before. I'm not saying this is the, the Blizzard employee, but it happens like a few months before this whole breast milk thing. Have you ever imagined in your life, in 2004 gaming, you pick up a little game called World of Warcraft that you would learn of the details of employees at said company stealing breast milk from nursing mothers, it's just, it's, it's kind of strange to sort of take a moment and recognize where we are today. Speaking of milking, Blizzard would also increase focus on microtransaction offers, including mounts, yeah. pets, and cosmetic outfits, often seen to be vastly superior to you those acquirable in-game. Their prices were absolutely sized as their highest package. The cash shop mounts look way better. Like, this was during a time, I think, uh... 
uh, Shadowlands PvP season, they had a new PvP mount, and it was a reskin of the Season 1 mount. Meanwhile, they're releasing, you know, obviously these very in-depth and unique, intricate models on the cash shop. In game for like their prices, like thirty dollars criticized as their highest package. Absolutely, would demand a price tag of fifty-five dollars, nearly matching that of a full AAA release. As onlookers reacted with awe at the lack of awareness or care that Blizzard showed to its community and image. As of this video, the results of the lawsuit are pending, but regardless of the outcome, it'll surely stand out as one of the darkest moments in the company's history. Yeah, still to this and day. And becoming increasingly difficult to break out of, as scrutiny remains to be at an all-time mm -hmm. high due to the destroyed trust between they and their community. As a result... A where, where people used to look at Blizzard games as no matter what they would release... Again, I said this earlier, Blizzard was the From Software of today. They could release... A, a paper bag with a turd in it and say it's it's wow too people would buy it because that's like how on point they were you never played a starcraft you never played a an rts game before starcraft 2 is coming out you're buying it you never played an rp an action rpg and diablo 3 which kind of ended up being poopoo it doesn't matter you're buying it that was the reputation they had but you know over these uh various controversies yeah, certainly people look at, at the releases with much more scrutiny. More pessimistically, I would say. The situation has been created where any flinch, positive or negative, is met with a dominating pessimism. Yeah. Employees daily suffer abuse, not only from the outside, but as recently mm -hmm. discovered, mm -hmm. also from the inside. And people take it too far as usual. Social media, people... I would never want to be a developer, a video game developer on social media. I a more power to people who do it. Maybe they 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 gain more from what they from the abuse that they have. But yeah, people are are like savage to video game developers on social media. Getting getting one shot by a shaman in two thousand and four to two thousand and seven gaming. If Twitter existed back then, yeah, that would be it. Would be I would I I would never want to be a video game developer on Twitter. You have to go through like so much abuse from. Just people who take it too far. Death threats, verbal abuse, all sorts of stuff. And then Corey, thank you, man. Today, you. they stared down the seemingly insurmountable task of repairing the damage caused to their relationship with their community. With each passing day, their environment representing a battlefield more so than that of a game development yeah. studio. While this itself is an unfair situation, many deem it a consequence of casting aside the goodwill of their player base consistently over the course of three tumultuous years. In the midst of the scandal, it was mm -hmm. announced that BlizzCon was cancelled for the year of 2022 yeah. and that it would see a major restructuring if and when it returns. It did return. Initially, a heavily community-focused innovator with franchises that redefined genres now leaves behind a sullied and controversial legacy in one of the most jarring and unforeseen falls in game development history. Quarterly reports show a consistent downward trend of active users, but at the same time, record-breaking revenue as patience and goodwill yep. are continuously traded away for short-term financial profit. Just as how it breathed life into the genre with its birth in 2004, so too does it with its decline in the modern year. Its fall giving rise to a new generation of MMOs, eager to claim the crown it once wore with pride and ambition. As players, this is a monologue right here. figures, and employees depart in record numbers, a particularly iconic phrase of theirs is seen to be more and more prophetic with each passing day. No, no king, king rules forever. forever. Damn. That was savage. We are going to offer a level 58 boost for uh -oh. purchase, but it does come with Wait, some restrictions, so it's going to be one per account. <laughs> Um, it's Accurate. not going to be usable on Blood Elf or What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Accurate. Hey, um, boss, uh, now that you're done with your video game, man, uh, I don't mean to rush you or nothing, but uh, uh, we got a lot of people waiting to be um, sentenced to their uh, eternal afterlife. <laughs> Send them in. 
This is a pretty good video. Who is this guy? Suing video game company Activision Blizzard for sexual harassment and wow. discrimination. They basically suspended. I'm kind of like blown away myself. I'm the one who made this video. What the hell? It's just. It's kind of just crazy to see it all laid out, beginning to end. 1999 to uh, this was uh, 2021 is crazy, man. The whole culture of Blizzard and the ebbs and flows, the highs and lows, the ups and downs is crazy. It's a roller coaster. I don't want to look like the scene. Really we failed in our purpose. And for that, I am sorry. Uh, in the community is full of a bunch of broken hearted people who feel alone and are now feeling weird because they're stuck between a weird spot of supporting the company that makes the game and not wanting to support these weird fucking ass grabbers. Interestingly, the board of directors of Activision rallying to Mr. Kodak's side almost immediately. This was, uh, the, the stock, by the way, rebounded pretty heavily once they were acquired by Microsoft. Uh, uh, This is a two hour video. I see. Only darkness before. Wow. I'm not commenting to I'm just kinda I am kinda like a little blown away. Maybe I should make another Pandora. Mm -mm -mm. We give retail a shot. Eh. Probably not. Retail's, I don't know, it's just not the game for me, I would say. I'm happy with Sod right now. Oh god. I'm scared. I'm happy with Sod right now, but retail is, I just, a lot of that just comes from not wanting to play two MMOs, but you guys know me, I'm a classic Andy. Oh, these things are all over the place. What the hell? Wait, this is my stream. Why is it pointing to my... Okay, interesting. I should probably change that. Well. Well now. So that was Pandora's Box, Episode 1. Um, this is my first reaction I've done. Um, really, what is there to be said? It's uh, quite the roller coaster. Quite the ride. Absolute insanity. You know the achievement? What a wild, strange trip it's been. Yeah, absolutely. It was a wild, strange trip. And here we are in 2024. And, uh, you know, Blizzard's still chugging along here. I would say that, I mean, I can't, I haven't played Dragonflight. I hear it's better. I have been playing Sod and Hardcore. I, I do like Sod. Um, there do remain to be controversies within the Blizzard sphere. Pretty, pretty steadily, but um, um, I would say it's not nearly as bad as it was in 20... Like, 2021 was probably the, the darkest it has ever been, to my recollection. Oh, dude, Fabian, thank you, man, for the 50 euros. Good lord, dude. Thank you so much, Fabian. Appreciate that. Um, so this is my first reaction... So there's been a, a bit of a, a request for React type of videos here and there. I figured I wanted to start with my own. Episode 1 of Pandora here is one of my biggest videos. This video took months and months and months to make. Two hour long video. How long is this reaction? Over four hours. I've been streaming for four hours and 30 minutes. It's insanity. Um, we might do more episodes of Pandora. Pandora. I might do other videos here and there. Um... How'd you guys like this reaction? Did you guys enjoy this? I kind of paused a lot. I don't, uh, if I do more reaction streams, I don't want to just like play it continuously. I want to, I want to pause a lot and give a lot of my input on it to make it more of a transformative work. It was good. You guys liked it? Well, good. Good. I'll uh 
I'll, I'm going to post this on my alternate channel, Bad Season Show, you see right here. Um, I'm going to repurpose this channel to like maybe Mad Season Show reacts. And, you know, every once in a while on stream, we can maybe start with the react or something. Obviously, I've seen this video before hundreds of times, typically when I was editing it. I have not watched it since I released it. So released uh, December 24th, 2021. It's been... Uh, Two years and about three months. Yeah, oh, I released this on Christmas. I remember that. This is like a Christmas gift to you guys. Um, I, I kind of started off by jumping into the deep end here by doing a freaking two-hour long video, but yeah, we can do all sorts of stuff to kind of just switch things up on stream here, give you guys something new, something fresh. But uh, I will be editing this and uploading it to Bad Season Show, which will be renamed and repurposed soon. So subscribe to this channel if you guys want to, um, if you guys want to see more reaction-based content from me. Here's you can always watch the original video as well. It's on my channel. You'll find it if you want it without all the pausing and stuff. But yeah, thank you for watching it. Thank you for watching me. I want to do movie nights like this with you guys. Um. I think that'll probably be it for me, though. I'm kind of wiped out after that. That took a lot of energy out of me. Thank you, Matt. Knocked off. Ran Tigabi. Original bad man. I like to, uh, I hope that uh, I was able to extrapolate my thoughts a little bit, give a little bit of background with how I edited this. I hope it was interesting to you. Thank you for watching it. Fabian as well. Thank you once more, man. I want to say thank you again for uh, in total the 100 euros of support there, Fabian. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to go work. I'm going to get some food right now, but after that, I'm going to see if I can finish editing this video for you guys. We'll have a, a video on the channel in a few days. Um, for those of you here on Twitch, I want to go ahead and send you guys on over to somebody. Uh, let's go see what Bobka's up to. He's doing BFD. I'm going to send you guys on over to Bobka, okay? Go watch some BFD, guys. Say hi to Bobka. Go have fun. I'll see you guys probably tomorrow. All right, guys. You take care of yourselves. Thank you again. Take care of yourselves and each other. Have a good day or night, whatever it is, wherever you may be. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.